Chapter 1761 Confrontation They suspect that you're the murderer. What did the cops say? Eva held his hands. She wanted to hear the truth. They did interrogate me. Lucy's death is bizarre, but I didn't do it. Did the Constantines call you? No. They think I murdered her. I see they don't trust me at all. From now on, I'm not helping them anymore. Louis's face fell. Now we have to look into Eva's car crash. There's something more about it. Something sinister, Jesse said. Yeah. Lucy died right after Eva got into the car crash. That can't be a coincidence. Sarah made an offhand comment. However, that gave Louis an idea. Wait. Eva's car crash could be something Lucy orchestrated. Later that day, Louis asked Julian and Jesse to go home first. Sarah went home as well while Eva was told to stay in the hospital for three days for now. The cops worked through the night on the case. Eventually, they noticed one similarity between Lucy and Eva, both. Ladies love the same man. That was the clue they needed to find the truth. Some arduous investigation later, they finally made some headway. Lucy had withdrawn a huge sum of money. Right after that, Eva's car was tailed, and the criminal crashed into her, causing an accident. Subsequently, the criminal called Lucy and murdered her over the cash. Louis stayed by Eva's side during her stay at the hospital. She had nightmares every night due to her head injury. The medication didn't help much. Fortunately, every time she woke up, she would see Louis by her side, and it made her feel safe. The Constantines lost sleep over this case as well. They were awaiting the investigation results. Losing their daughter impacted their lives heavily. Their child was gone before they were. I know it's him. He killed our girl. Fiona roared. Let's see what the cops say. If he is the murderer, we'll see to it that he faces judgment. My poor girl. We can't let her murderer go unpunished, no. Blood will have blood. Three days had gone by after the accident and murder. At 9.30 a.m. on the fourth day, the cops called the Constantines, asking them to make a trip to the police station. At the same time, Eva received a call as well. After confirming she was fine, the cops asked her to make a trip to the police station to record her testimonial. Louis gave her a ride to the police station. The moment they got out of the car, they ran into the Constantines. Agitated, Fiona came to berate Eva. You witch. You got our daughter killed. You give me my girl back, you little. B-T-C-H. Watch. Your. Tongue. Mrs. Constantine, Louis hissed. You. You did this to my daughter. You killed her because you wanted to marry this little B asterisk T-C-H, didn't you? We'll. Make you pay for it. Fiona growled, her eyes tearful. Don't talk to him, honey. He'll pay for what he did. If I had known he was an ingrate, I wouldn't have helped his parents. Mr. Constantine, I swear I didn't do this, Louis answered seriously for old time's sake and for the help they gave. His parents back then, you're denying it. I'm sure this woman has convinced you to kill our daughter. You thought Lucy got in your way of finding love, didn't you? How could you be so evil and kill her just to avoid marrying her? After thinking about the matter for an entire night, Louis had figured out the whole case. No, Lucy brought this on. Herself. Karma bit her in the asterisk SS faster than she could imagine. If you want answers, ask your daughter what she did. Oh, no, you can't. She's dead. Louis then led Eva into the police station. The cops talked to both parties. Eva entered the interrogation room for the recording of her testimonial while Louis stood guard outside the room. Sarah arrived a while later. Chapter 1762 The Apple and the Tree The cops asked Eva about her meeting with Lucy, and she answered honestly. In another room, the Constantines were told of the investigation's results and another piece of good news. Lucy's killer, Zach Lore, had been arrested and would arrive at the police station soon. Officer, Louis is right there. Why aren't you arresting him? Fiona demanded. According to our investigations, Mr. Gilmore is innocent. He has nothing to do with this case. What? But he hired this Zack character. You're letting him off the hook just because he's rich. Did he bribe all of you? Fiona refused to believe this. Calm down, Mrs. Constantine. 
Calm down, calm down, how can I calm down when that killer and his B asterisk TCH are still alive? My daughter died, she was only 27, and she wasn't even married yet. Fiona started bawling like a baby. The sad truth about Bruce Willis. Deteriorating condition. Courtney Cox's perspective on filming the beloved series. The cops had gotten news of Zack's arrival, and they swiftly went into interrogation mode with him. Scared out of his wits, Zack confessed all of his crimes. Not even one detail was spared. After comparing evidence and fingerprints, Zack was identified as the murderer and Lucy as the mastermind. Louie and Eva were about to leave, but a cop stopped them. Mr. Gilmore, Miss Duncan, we need you at the conference hall. Did something happen? Louie asked. It's about Miss Duncan's accident. We've cracked the case. B. Constantine's had just entered the conference hall when Eva and Louie came in. The sight of those two made Cornelius and Fiona's blood boil. Silence. You are summoned because these cases are more closely related than you think. We'll be explaining the whole thing to you now. Officers, it's them. They killed my daughter. You need to arrest them. Fiona pointed at Eva and Louie. Calm down, Mrs. Constantine. The cop then played some videos. The first one showed Lucy withdrawing her money at the bank. All the cash was tucked away into a big sack, and she left with it. Your daughter withdrew a large sum of money five days ago. 220 grand, to be exact. She must have had some use for it, Fiona quickly explained, though she didn't know why Lucy needed that. Money. What are beta male traits? Tiger Woods is, different man, ten years after. Scandal. The next video showed Eva in the underground car park. After she was gone, an off-road vehicle followed her. Closely. Twenty minutes later, they came to a quieter road, and Eva's car was sent flying away. Zack was seen. Getting out of the car and approaching Eva's car, but the fireman showed up. Eva was then taken to the hospital. That car crash was a job request, to crash into Eva's car and slash her face up. Zack took it, but before he could finish his job, the fireman showed up. Who did this? Who hired him? Louis wanted to know who the mastermind was. His fists were balled up. If it weren't for the fireman, Eva would have been ruined. This is my fault. I didn't think Lucy had the capability for evil. At this level, she tried to ruin Eva's life. Eva couldn't believe this car crash was an attempt on her future. She had thought it was a regular accident. The Constantines exchanged a look, and Fiona sneered. It could be anyone. I bet tons of people would love to destroy her. Look at her. She's a little b asterisk tch who knows no shame. Eva looked at Fiona. Oh, so that's how it is. She mocked. I see the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Oh, sorry. Didn't fall far from the tree. Chapter 1763 Closure. What did you say? Silence. Mr. Gilmore raised a crucial question. The one who wanted Miss Duncan's face slashed was none other than Lucy Constantine. She envies Miss Duncan's looks, and so she hired Zack to slash her face. The Constantines couldn't believe this. Cornelius gnashed his teeth. Impossible. My daughter couldn't have done that. My daughter was as beautiful as this woman. She couldn't have done this. The cops played a few more videos. They were voice recordings of what happened in the cars. The first one was the recording of the call Zack made while the second one was the recording of what happened in Lucy's car. They had argued about the sum of money that should be paid. The Constantines cried the moment they heard their daughter's voice, and they could see why the cops came to the earlier conclusion. And so, Zack went to meet Lucy. She refused to pay him in full, so he took her life and escaped with all the money. Do you need further clarification, Mr. and Mrs.? Constantine. So, I can sue them for damages then. Eva asked coldly. The cops nodded. You can. Very well. Mrs. Constantine, I shall sue your family for what your daughter did to me. Have a heart, will you? We just lost our daughter, and you wish to sue us. Fiona started playing the victim. But Eva refused to spare them any sympathy. She icily said, I'll go through due process. She pulled Louie up. Let's go, Louie. Why you're not leaving? Fiona shouted. Louis, you promised us that plot of land, remember? 
Don't forget to give it to us. Cornelia stood up at once. Even in the face of his daughter's death, all he cared about was profit. Louis turned around and stared at the Constantines. We're over, Constantines. Louis, how could you? My daughter may be gone, but you can't cut us off. We helped your family out when you needed it most. What would they have looked like when they were older? Changing your diet can easily put on those Thanksgiving pants and enjoy, friends, best episodes photos that will make you look tea. And you've been reaping the rewards all these years. I gave you everything you asked for. The favor is repaid. Louis held Eva's hand and left. Not only did the Constantines lose their daughter, but they also lost the plot of land they were supposed to get. Yet, they couldn't do anything about it. Eva felt like a weight had been lifted off her shoulders the moment they emerged from the police station. She rested her head on Louis's shoulder and took a deep breath. Smells like fall now, we can finally be together. Louis held her shoulders, he was still shuddering from the near tragedy that could have happened. Thank God you're fine. Will we still be together if my face really got slashed? Of course. If your face was slashed, I'd scour the world for the best doctors for you. We would face it together. Eva smiled. Thank God I'm fine. I'd probably die if my face was slashed. The case was cracked, and the arranged marriage was no more. Eva had a bit of a scare, but in return, she could finally be with the love of her life without worries. Three days later, Eva's manager sued the Constantines for damages and demanded payment of nearly 200 grand. The Constantines lamented their fate, but they had to pay the price or they would be imprisoned. Louis, Eva, Julian, and Jesse had dinner at a fine dining restaurant. It was a happy dinner. Eva's forehead was covered in a layer of bandage which she hid under a hat, but she looked a lot better now. Her skin was glowing, and she had a great appetite. I can't wait to attend your wedding, Eva, Jesse said. Previously, Eva would sigh every time her wedding was mentioned, but now, she answered happily, we'll hold one as soon as possible. Chapter 1764 Normal Life Yeah, Louis at that age. He should be raising a family by now. Julian smiled. He wanted Louis to get married. Soon. I'll try to hold the wedding before Christmas, Louis said swiftly. None of them talked about the Constantines. As it would just ruin the mood. Julian and Jesse took Gilmore Corporation's private jet the next day and flew to their film set. They didn't have time to fool around at work as they had to shoot some crucial scenes. Only about a month was left until the shoot was supposed to wrap up. All the crew members realized that Julian and Jesse's chemistry got a lot better, especially during the romantic scenes. The look in their eyes told a thousand stories. That was how everyone knew that Julian and Jesse were dating in real life. Jesse messed up a few takes of a scene where she needed to cry while hugging Julian. She thought that it was impossible because every time she hugged him, all she wanted to do was smile. Only delight filled her heart when she was with him, so how could she cry? Jesse, just imagine something really bad. Like maybe Julian was stolen by another woman. Vincent suggested. Jesse shot Julian a look. What? So, you're going to let another woman come near you? Julian sighed in silence. Vincent, just shut up and do your work. You're going to ruin my relationship at this rate. Oh. Whoops. Vincent quickly smiled. That won't happen in real life, don't worry. Just a little hypothetical. Calm down. Jesse. I need some onions. Jesse had no choice left. Her assistant got her an onion, and she chopped it a little. That. Worked well and she started crying. All right, now. Jesse darted back to Julian and rested her head on his shoulders. She was crying uncontrollably on camera. It was a good take, but Jesse was still crying even after the scene. No matter how hard she rubbed her eyes, they still felt tingly. Well, guess I have to take her to the waiting room and give her all my love, Julian thought. When the couple emerged from the waiting room, Jessie's eyes were still a little red, but so were her lips. The shooting went by really fast, and everyone had fun, especially the couple. One week went by before anyone realized it. Jessie was particularly sore after the shooting session today as she had to wear the stunt wire for the whole day. Julian was worried for her. 
He rubbed some soothing salve all over her after they returned to the hotel and tried to convince her to use a stunt double. Jessie didn't mind him rubbing the salve all over her, but she wasn't about to use a stunt double. When Julian was done rubbing the salve on her, Jessie turned around and was met with a gaze of desire. You've been working through the night for two days straight. You should get some rest, you know. Jessie pulled her clothes down just in case the sight of her skin stoked his flames of desire. Julian narrowed his eyes. What? You think I can't go on? Oh God. You and your ego. So cute. She wrapped her arms around his neck and buried her head in his chest. I know you can still go on. I just don't want to tire you out. Julian let her off the hook. It wasn't because his stamina was running low, but because she had to rest after the day. She had. And so, the couple scrolled through their phones. He played a few matches to wind down while Jessie was scrolling through some shorts. That was when she noticed a few guys doing some sexy dance moves. She kept replaying that short, and that attracted Julian's attention. He took a quick look and noticed the video she was watching. She's watching a video of other guys while she has me by her side. He had no idea what to feel. Chapter 1765 Rumors Hey, why are you watching them? Look at me, I'm better than them. The jealous Julian pulled his shirt up, showing off his abs to Jessie. Her cheeks burned, and Julian covered her head with his clothes, pushing her closer to his chest. Jessie giggled as she rubbed her cheeks against his chest, causing Julian's flames of desire to flare up. He was going to let her off the hook that night, but he couldn't do that now. Not after she kept replaying that video. If I don't give her what she wants, she might keep searching for similar videos. You don't seem tired at all. Why don't we take this to the bed and have a little dance? Oh, you can dance. I want to see, said Jessie happily. Of course, I know how to dance. I was the dance champion during the first year of my career. He gave up dancing. After he started acting full-time. He could still dance, however. You should get to know more about me, he said in a grating voice before pressing his lips against hers. Jessie's heart exploded with delight. Her heart would always flutter every time she saw his pictures and compilation. Videos that were made by his fans. And now I'm his girlfriend. This is bliss. She was really proud of herself. Her boyfriend was the man of every girl's dream, but now he was hers and hers alone. It was a passionate night, but Jessie paid the price for it the next day. Getting out of bed was too much for her after. All that action, so her schedule was delayed. Lisa, who was filming in a set near Julian and Jessie, had caught wind of the rumors. Everyone said that they were dating and shared a room every night. She was disappointed, and she knew Jessie was now on the list of people she should never offend. At first, she thought she had a chance with Julian, but her hopes were dashed. In fact, all the female celebrities' hopes were dashed. Time flew, and it was close to wrapping up the shoot. Whenever Jessie had time, she would video call her sister and parents. November came, and with it, the chilly winds of fall. Finally, the shooting came to an end. It was a wrap. On the final day of shooting, Julian walked up to her with a bouquet in his hands. There were people around them. But he didn't care. He hugged Jessie and kissed her forehead. Jessie was the only person he had eyes for. Nobody else was worth his time. Everyone envied the couple, especially the ladies. Once upon a time, Julian belonged to everyone, but now he was Jessie's. At the same time, one piece of good news reached Julian. Louis was already preparing for his wedding. Pretty soon. We'll get to attend their wedding. Jessie celebrated her final night on set with a big feast. Everyone was invited. Lexi even found a boyfriend among the crew members. He was a part of the camera crew, and they had fallen in love. All Jessie wanted was to take a break. The filming had been hectic, and rest was a luxury. On the night before their return to Averna, snow fell. It was a beautiful scene, and Jessie found herself in the fields. Outside the hotel, beside her stood Julian, who was taking pictures of the snow together with her. Then, she posted a photo of their backs on her social media. 
Her caption read, Here's to many more years of you by my side. Jessie would love to make her relationship public, but the time was not right. To her surprise, Julian was the first one to like her post. That honor used to belong to Lexi. When Jessie checked her post later in the night, there were already more than 30,000 comments underneath all because of Julian's like. His fans kept a close eye on his day-to-day -day activities, and his liking of Jessie's post led them here. Everyone was speculating about who his girlfriend was. Rumors said he was dating the female lead of his new show, but there was no evidence yet. Chapter 1766 Another Wedding The fans consumed every piece of information available, even though they were only scraps. Anything for Julian. They'd say. The couple flew back to Averna the next day. Jessie invited Eva to shop and have tea. Then, she and Queenie returned home to see their parents. Eventually, it was time for Eva's wedding. The news of it was a bombshell for the industry as Eva was really famous while her husband was the boss of the industry's leading company. Yet, they didn't invite too many people to their wedding. If they were to invite everyone they knew, they would need a venue that could house at least 2,000 guests. Hence, they planned to hold a low-profile wedding. Eva didn't mind. She never liked to brag about her life anyway. The wedding happened one week later. Julian and Jesse were invited, of course, but only as guests. Eva had asked her best friend to be the bridesmaid. Louis looked dashing during the wedding, and Eva looked gorgeous in white. This was a wedding most people could only dream of, a picturesque wedding of a prince and a princess. Eva was the center of everyone's attention, and Louis expressed all the love he had for her. It was true love. Jesse and Julian were seated at the first table, their hands clasped together tightly under the table. The ceremony kept going on until night descended. It was a sacred day that nobody would forget, and then everyone attended the wedding reception at night. Jesse had changed into a white silk dress which she specifically picked for the occasion. It made her gleam like a little fairy. It was then all the guests realized the Gilmore brothers had both found the loves of their lives. Eva's wedding went viral. There weren't many pictures of the event, but the few they had made a big ripple across the net. Her fans loved how she looked, and they thought her husband was the perfect man for her. Eventually, the wedding came to an end, and soon it was Christmas Eve. Louie and Eva had gone on their honeymoon abroad, so Julian was invited to the Silverstein's place during Christmas. The Silverstein couple would love to marry Jessie off to him. Julian noticed their warm welcome. It was very hard not to. Jessie wanted to spend more time with her parents at night, but her mother told her to spend it with Julian instead. She even told Jessie there would be no breakfast for her the next morning since they had places to go. Jessie didn't mind staying with Julian. In fact, she would gladly do it. Now that her mother was giving her an excuse to leave the house, she followed Julian back to his home. Another important event of her life would take place the next night, her first movie premiere. The excitement kept her awake. She had also seen a lot of the movie's promotional photos making their rounds online. It was then she realized she had been looking at Julian like he was her whole world. And Julian, unlike most of the time, was smiling. As well, that's the power of love. Only when he was with someone whom he loved would Julian crack a smile. Jesse also noticed something else. When she first joined the set, she would only steal glances at Julian. Her love was budding. Yet she had not the courage to say it out loud. She also noticed a few photos where Julian was getting jealous. Oh, I love these photos. They detail my memories with him. Our memories. She fell asleep eventually, but she woke up a little later. Groggily, she picked her phone up to look at the time. Julian had woken up as well, and he hugged her. It's still early. Get back to sleep. I can't. Oh my gosh, it's already 5.30 in the morning. She was still yawning, but sleep wouldn't claim her. Julian got up as well, and they stared outside the window for a moment. The skies were still dark. He said, I'll take you around. It should freshen us up, then let's have breakfast. Chapter 1767 Watching the Movie Premiere how about you sleep here? 
I'll take the couch so that I won't disturb your sleep. Jessie was embarrassed because she was too excited to fall asleep but knew she shouldn't disturb his sleep. However, the man reached over and pulled her into his embrace. Why don't we do some exercising? Sure. Now, the sky is still quite dark. Why don't we wait a bit? Jessie asked with a serious expression. The man burst out laughing. The exercise I'm referring to doesn't need us to head downstairs. Immediately getting what he meant, Jessie blushed and buried herself in the man's arms, unable to reject his request. Lord, men were generally the most lustful in the morning. In the end, Jessie couldn't stand her drowsiness despite her excitement. The man had worn her out. When she woke up again, it was already 11 a.m. Julian had ordered food for her so they could leave for the premiere in the afternoon. Jessie wore a cute yellow sweater with a small cap over her long hair, making her look cute and innocent. On the other hand, Julian was wearing a mask with casual clothes. But when he was walking on the street, he attracted everyone's attention with his model-like figure. The two invited Lexi and her boyfriend to the movie premiere as well. As Jessie was in high spirits, she felt her heart constantly thumping rapidly inside her chest as she held Julian's hand. When the premiere finally began, they saw Gilmore Corporation's eye-catching an astonishing promotional logo on the big screen, followed by the movie's opening. B. Special effects used in the movie were excellent, resulting in a very realistic mythical world. Also, her and Julian's names appearing together under the main cast section looked domineering and eye-catching. Jessie felt her heartbeat speed up again as she looked at her name, feeling like this was just a dream. A hurricane can be as powerful as ten atomic bombs what would they have look? Was this bicycle left here eons ago by King Leonidas himself? It has made Marina Baccarin A.S. Eva's name appeared soon after theirs. The 3D effect used was brilliant and gave the viewers a sense that they had been transported inside the movie and were taking a real trip into the mystical world. During the movie, Jesse could hear the sounds of gasps and exclamations inside the hall, obviously indicating that they were astonished by the special effects. She could only applaud the production crew for their wealth and capability. She felt like she could watch these special effects all day. Following that, a young celestial servant appeared on the screen. While Jessie watched the elegant immortal she played, she thought her features looked very delicate under the great camera movements and lighting. It was as if she were a real, unrealistically beautiful young immortal. Oh, heavens, isn't that Jessie? She looks so beautiful. A young woman sitting behind Jessie exclaimed in excitement. Jessie had dubbed her the voice of her character herself and wasn't expecting her voice to sound so gentle and engaging. Her tone sounded clear and penetrative, and her every expression imbued the crowd. Meanwhile, Julian was also attracted by the image of his wife on screen and couldn't help but praise himself for having such a good eye and choosing her to be the female protagonist. Although filming was difficult, watching the beautiful scenes made Jessie feel that all her efforts were worth it. On the screen, Jessie looked cute and slightly mischievous. It wasn't until she watched herself getting beaten up and thrown out like a sandbag that she felt Julian's demon. Lord, the male protagonist, was exceptionally handsome. She couldn't help but let out a few exclamations while clutching Julian's hand tightly. You're so handsome. Turning to look at her, Julian kissed her forehead and cooed, I'm yours. That moment, Jessie smiled so brightly that she squinted her eyes into slits. Yes, he's mine. No matter how handsome he is, he's mine. Screams echoed throughout the entire movie hall. It wasn't an exaggeration to say that all the screams came from women. Julian was already used to it, but Jessie, just like his fans, was madly infatuated with him. Back on screen, the young immortal servant fell into Demon Lord's arms, and a shocking love story began. After the movie ended, Jesse and Julian came out of the hall with their masks on and saw many excited fans standing outside, seemingly still immersed in the movie. They kept praising the movie while walking away. Chapter 1768 I wish they were together. At this moment, Jesse and Julian were inside an elevator. Julian had his hood on while Jesse hugged him tightly, snuggling her face in his chest. The four young women who just came in had been busy chatting with each other since they were in the courtyard. 
They didn't pay any attention to the couple already inside the elevator and continued to talk loudly. The two of them looked so good together. I kept fangirling over them throughout the whole movie. How I wish they were together in real life as well. I heard that they are a real couple. I wonder if that's true, but they have my blessing anyway. I used to dislike Jessie, but now I understand the hype about her beauty. She's indeed born to be a protagonist. Isn't she? I think so too. Gosh, did you guys see how handsome Julian was? He never fails to steal women's hearts. Whoever has him as her boyfriend must be the luckiest person ever. I wish I could switch places with Jesse. This way, I could kiss him. Meanwhile, Jesse could feel the man she hugged freeze for a moment and almost burst out laughing. She then glanced over at the young woman who said she wanted to kiss Julian. The young woman wore a cute outfit that suited her slightly plump figure. Unsurprisingly, she spoke her mind so openly and didn't care what others thought of her. When they finally came out of the elevator and headed toward Julian's car, Jesse suddenly smiled and hugged Julian's arm while skipping. What were you so nervous about? Julian caressed her head while saying, you know the answer. Did your fans scare you? It seems they accept our relationship. Jesse exclaimed joyously. Stopping, Julian took her hands and reassured her, you don't have to worry about how others feel about you. What's important is our love for each other. Jesse blinked a few times and nodded in agreement, but the words those fans said still made her happy inside. I know that. No matter what happens, we will stay with each other. Jesse wrapped her arms around Julian's neck and stood on her toes to plant a kiss on his cheek. She thought, Julian looks so handsome. No wonder other women are head over heels for him. He looks super attractive on screen and can make anyone's heart flutter with just one action. Tonight, he managed to charm everyone through the big screen, so much so that the whole place was filled with screams. With the help of the amazing special effects, his portrayal of the demon lord seemed very realistic. Even when he raised his eyebrow or his head, or even made a move with his hand, it looked so handsome that it made everyone scream. Let's head home. Jessie's eyes looked shy, and she thought, perhaps this is a side effect of watching the movie. I want to have him entirely tonight. Why do you want to head home? Julian seemed to have guessed her thoughts but still wanted to tease her. While hiding her face in his chest, she urged, do something naughty. Come on, let's go. Hearing that, Julian burst out laughing and brought her over to the car before speeding back home to do the naughty thing she mentioned. The next morning, Jesse and Julian arrived at the company together. Vincent and the few producers were there. Because they had to attend an advertising campaign to promote the movie later in the afternoon. Julian, after our careful consideration, we decided not to let you and Jesse appear at the event together. I'm sure. You know the reason, right? You have too many female fans, and we're worried about box office sales. Impossible. We have to appear on stage together, Julian immediately refused. We are just worried about the movie not selling well. After all, this is Jesse's first movie, and it would be bad if the movie sales weren't good. That's right. Julian, just bear with it for a while. You and Jesse will head to different event sites at the same time, so. In a way, you guys are still promoting the movie together. When Jesse heard the other's suggestions, she joined them in persuading him, I think director Cooper is right. The investment for this movie is so large that it might have quite a huge effect if the fans refuse to buy our relationship. Had we made it public, Julian could ignore everyone else's words except Jesse's. He then asked unhappily, why can't we appear together? On stage. Chapter 1769 Attending an Advertising Campaign Jesse glanced at him and squinted her eyes while pleading, just listen to what Director Cooper says. Fine. Julian. Finally agreed. Seeing that, Vincent and the others felt relieved. It seemed like the only person who could persuade. Julian was Jesse. Later, Jesse had her makeup done at the company and put on a custom-made dress. She appeared at the event venue inside the shopping mall at 3 p.m. Her skin looked as fair as glistening snow, and her black, straight hair looked stunning and smooth. 
When she and Julian separated at the company, Julian personally saw her off until they reached the car. Right. Before she got in, she sees the opportunity to kiss him. Then, Julian reminded her, be careful, and call me if anything happens. All right. If the MC asks you something you don't want to answer, you can refuse to answer it. Since Jesse had never attended any advertising campaigns, she was quite nervous. She nodded in agreement. All right then. I'll keep that in mind. You should hurry up and get ready too. Afterward, Julian closed the door and watched her car leave. On the road, Jesse's manager, Sarah, mentioned many things to Jesse and even showed her the answers to some potential questions. Sarah also told Jesse that the MC would ask questions according to these questions and answers, so Jesse only had to answer them according to the given answers. Therefore, Jesse memorized all those answers while going to the venue, wanting to remember them all. Sarah, I'm so nervous. What should I do? This is the first time I'm promoting a movie. What if I get stage fright and stammer on stage? Jesse asked Sarah. Don't worry, Fabian will be there as well. You can let him answer if you're not sure how to. He's more experienced. In these things, Jesse nodded, still feeling so nervous that her hands were sweating. Since she had gone to watch the movie premiere yesterday, she was confident in her work. Moreover, the movie rating skyrocketed to 9.6 right after the premiere, which was considerably high. Meanwhile, back at the company, Julian and a few veteran actors would be heading to the event together, but since the venue was not far from where they were, the company hadn't arranged for them to leave. Julian was sitting at the cafe in the lobby, feeling worried the more he thought about Jesse heading to the advertising campaign alone. What if she gets too nervous? What if the MC asks her difficult questions? What if someone thinks she and Fabian are a couple? A lot of questions filled Julian's mind, and his heart began thumping wildly. In the end, he stood up and looked at Vincent before blurting out, I'm not going there anymore. Once he said that, he grabbed his keys and speed. Walked out. Hey, Julian, where are you going? It's almost time for the event. How can you walk out on us? Vincent ran after him. However, Julian had already disappeared from the lobby. He dashed toward his car and got inside before speeding toward the shopping mall where Jesse would be attending the advertising campaign. In the meantime, Jesse arrived at the shopping mall and entered the green room through the employee only passage. Fabian was already dressed handsomely and was waiting for her. When their gazes met, they smiled at each other. Oh my gosh, Jesse, you look so pretty today. Fabian sincerely praised. You also look very handsome. Jesse smiled and praised back. Don't be nervous on stage. If you don't want to answer the questions, you can just leave them to me. Sure, thank you. When Jesse and Fabian finally got on stage, Jesse found that she had underestimated the number of fans that came to the event. All she saw was a sea of black filling the entire ground floor of the shopping mall, as well as fans peering down from above. Feeling nervous, Jesse pursed her lips while her hands, which were holding the microphone, started sweating. All right, let's invite both actors to introduce themselves. The MC was a man, and he was the kind that looked crafty at first glance. Chapter 1770 On behalf of my girlfriend, Fabian very naturally introduced himself, followed by Jesse, who took a deep breath before introducing herself. Hello everyone, I'm Jesse Silverstein. I play Estelle in Fallen. Heaven. I hope everyone enjoys my performance. Whoa. She's so beautiful. Her skin is so smooth and fair. It looks like it's glowing. Seeing the fans below her eyeing her, Jessie was still suppressing her nervousness, but... Then she thought she might be even more nervous when the MC started asking questions. As she expected, the MC began by asking questions about the storyline. After a few questions, he began steering off course and asking private questions that fans were curious about. Jesse, you're new to this industry, right? Everyone must not know you that well, so can you answer a few questions from the fans? Sure, go ahead. Jesse smiled and replied, Who's your first kiss? Jesse was stunned. Can I tell them the answer? 
However, she cleverly asked, are you referring to the movie? Of course, it's our male protagonist. No, I'm not. We're more curious about your private life. About that, I'm sorry, but it's not convenient for me to answer that question. Sure, if that's too difficult for you. How about this one? How many past boyfriends have you dated? Just tell us the number. The male MC began to ask tricky questions. Meanwhile, the fans were all looking forward to the answer, wanting to know the number of past boyfriends the new rising actress had dated. Jessie stuck out one finger and said, one, whoa, why don't you tell us about your standards when choosing your future boyfriend or husband? Would you prefer a tall and handsome playboy or a gentle and caring man? In Jessie's mind, she answered, I don't mean to brag, but my boyfriend is not only tall and handsome but also gentle and caring too. I, Jessie suddenly didn't know how to rephrase her words to make them sound less like she was bragging. Twelve celebrities who almost ruined their careers with one movie its tail makes this cat stand app. Guys with the anti-relationship mentality often think this way see what coffee she prefer. How about we do it this way? Among all the male celebrities in the entertainment industry, who do you think is your dream boyfriend? When the MC saw the crowd growing more excited, he began to probe deeper into Jesse's private life. We're here to promote our movie, so let's keep these private questions unanswered for suspense. Fabian tried to help. The fans like Jesse very much. That's why we're all curious and want to know her better. The MC chuckled, not intending to let Jesse go. The question was a hard one to answer because Vincent had asked Jesse not to reveal her relationship with Julian. Just as everyone was waiting for Jesse's answer, a figure strode up from beside the stage. The man took off his hood and mask, revealing his identity. Then, Julian approached Jesse and took away her microphone. At that moment, Jesse was stunned while the fans below were screaming at the top of their lungs, thinking, Oh my gosh. It's Julian. He's here. Let me answer that question on behalf of my girlfriend. Of course, her dream boyfriend would be me. After saying that, he hugged Jesse's shoulder, indicating his identity. At that instant, the crowd below the stage was in an uproar. Julian had openly revealed his relationship with Jesse, which was beyond their expectations. There was no need for any evidence because they all knew it was confirmed just by looking at Julian's gentle eyes that were on Jesse. Meanwhile, the MC had a stiff smile on his face. He coughed softly and tried to control the situation. It seems like Mr. Gilmore does deserve the title of best male actor. Jesse leaned toward his ear and whispered, Why are you here? Aren't you supposed to be at another event? I'm worried about you. Julian lowered his body and responded softly beside her ear. Director Cooper is going to be furious. I don't care as long as it makes me happy. Why you? Jesse stared at him coquettishly, while Julian looked back at her while smiling. At this moment, his fans could only see his side profile because all his attention was on Jesse. Chapter 1771 Getting Bombarded by Reporters Many young women in the crowd were extremely jealous as they watched the man whom they idolized reveal his relationship with Jesse. It was like a pang in their hearts. If there are no other questions, let's wrap up this event. Once Julian finished his words, he gave the microphone to one of the staff and left hand in hand with Jessie. When she descended the stage, many fans squeezed toward her. At that, Julian immediately pulled her into his arms to shield her from the crowd, hugging her figure so she would not get squeezed. Meanwhile, the bodyguards immediately came over and guided them toward the green room. Like both of them had guessed, Vincent was so furious that his mustache curled up, resembling a handlebar. Mustache. Julian had abandoned his scheduled advertising campaign and gone to Jesse's campaigning venue. As if. He thought Vincent had not had enough, he publicized their relationship. They had invested giant funds in this movie, and they no longer had any high hopes for it. Instead, all they were. Hoping was that they could break even. Meanwhile, the couple's announcement had spread like wildfire on the internet and even caused a network to crash. Julian, the most brilliant man in the entertainment industry, was suddenly revealed to be taken. How could his fans not be saddened by such news? 
therefore, a rise of netizens claimed they would not be supporting them. Many of his female fans clamored to announce that they would boycott the movie as well. Just as they had expected, the loudest protest came from the female fans. When Julian brought Jesse back to the company, Vincent was furious but did not dare to throw a fit. Not only that, but he even had an uncomfortable time suppressing his anger. Julian, didn't we reach an agreement earlier? Can't. You bear with it just for a while. What you did will only cause a huge impact on our movie and affect the box office. Sales. Julian did not comment while Jesse comforted Vincent. Director Cooper, don't be mad. Here, have some tea and cool down. Following that, Vincent accepted the tea and drank it. Since he was still angry, he choked on the tea and began coughing fiercely, clutching his chest. Oh, no, Director Cooper, are you all right? She immediately reached out and patted his back in concern. Did we trigger his sickness or something? I choked on the tea, he explained bitterly before looking at Julian with a defeated expression. I can't scold him. Nor can I beat him up, and I even have to think twice before saying anything lest I want to lose my job. This is so exasperating. Vincent, stop worrying. As for the box office sales, let's leave it to fate. Julian spoke some words of concern. Before turning to Jesse, let's go home. She nodded and assured Vincent, Director Cooper, there is nothing to worry about. The movie is amazing. Vincent admired her utter calmness in this situation, but it was not unexpected. Even if her first movie ended as a disaster, she still had her identity as Mrs. Julian Gilmore, so her situation would not be any worse than the other celebrities. In the meantime, Jesse and Julian arrived outside the parking lot. Several black MPVs parked on the side, and dozens of reporters were waiting for them to appear before surrounding the two. Mr. Gilmore, are you and Miss Silverstein dating? When are you getting married? When did you guys start dating? Miss Silverstein, are you pregnant? Jesse was taken aback by that question, but she still politely waved her hand and denied being pregnant. No, I'm not. We're not thinking of having children at the moment. Julian held her hand and turned to look at the bodyguards, who immediately came over and shielded them until they entered the car. Inside the vehicle, she noticed that the reporters had no intentions of leaving and were constantly tapping on the car. I feel sorry for Director Cooper. She sighed. He reached over and held her hand. How about you? Are you worried about the box office sales? After giving it some serious thought, she answered, No. I'm not worried about your fans boycotting the movie. Either because I'm your fan too. Perhaps, I would feel disappointed after knowing you're taken, but that doesn't stop me from liking you. So, yes, I'll still watch your movie. She was explaining things from a fan's point of view. Chapter 1772 Surprise Fireworks Display Once she finished her explanation, she hugged the man's waist while saying joyously, To be honest, I was extremely shocked and touched when you stepped on stage today. Julian rubbed his forehead against hers while reassuring her, Wherever you are, that's where I want to be. In the meantime, the public relations department at Gilmore Corporation was working overtime today, helping Julian manage the comments. Since he had already announced his relationship, they could only give their relationship more publicity. What was more, Julian's action of ditching his campaign to make a sudden appearance at Jesse's today was enough to touch many. Soon, someone posted his schedule of the day, proving that he loved her dearly and leading the fans to accept them. As expected, Gilmore Corporation's public relations department was phenomenal at directing public opinion and managed to convince his fans. Many of them had even begun giving the couple their blessings. Moreover, the movie was due to premiere on the first day of the new year, and the entire production crew felt like they were sitting on pins and needles. During that time, it was said that Vincent was admitted to the hospital. Because of insomnia, which stemmed from his awful mood and anxiety. On New Year's Eve, Julian and Jesse had a family dinner at the Gilmore residence before heading to the hospital to visit him. By now, Vincent had given up and decided not to panic about it. However, this was the first movie that rendered 
him insecure in his years of directing. He had prepared numerous special effects that would be used in the movie. Before it even began shooting, which showed how much dedication he put into this film. Julian, I'm only left with one belief, to believe you. I trust that with your popularity, the ticket sales won't be terrible. He held Julian's hand while saying that. Don't worry, if the ticket sales are awful, I'll put in a good word for you so that Louis won't fire you, Julian teased. Jessie, who was beside them, was originally feeling sympathetic toward Vincent, but she could not help but burst out laughing when she heard what Julian said. You'll know the answer tomorrow, so just go on with your day. She assured him. At night, Julian brought Jessie to a place where they could enjoy the countdown. The two enjoyed the fireworks, illuminating the sea with candlelight and red wine. Later in the night, she saw someone posting the same fireworks on social media, to which the comments were asking, I heard that this fireworks display was arranged by a wealthy man to make his girlfriend happy. I'm curious who that lucky woman is and how she feels having someone light fireworks above the sea for an hour. When Jessie read the comment, she could not help but think, I didn't expect I could enjoy the fireworks a rich man prepared for his girlfriend. Feeling curious, she ran over to Julian and showed him her phone. How did you know there would be a rich man? Lighting the fireworks for his girlfriend there. Was it your friend? After watching the video, he went silent for a moment before answering, the rich man is me, and you're the girlfriend. She was speechless and stunned for a few seconds. What? It was for me all along. So, it's you. Are those fireworks for me? Jessie was touched beyond words. She would never have dreamt that. Julian was such a romantic and that she could be part of the experience. Smooch. With a smile, she hugged and kissed him. Thank you, my dear Mr. Gilmore. He reached out to embrace her. Now that the fireworks are done, shouldn't we be heading home so that you can thank me properly? She knew he was up to no good just by looking at him, so she nodded shyly. Sure, let's go home. Inside the car, she smiled sweetly when she found more videos on social media and saw that many were jealous of the woman who received the fireworks display. The one being envied by all is me. Right after midnight, the cinemas showing Julian's latest movie were packed, and the box office sales were consistently on top in just one day. To that, Vincent was utterly delighted. Not only was I worried for nothing, but the movie is also a hit with a high review score. Chapter 1773 A Drunk Jesse. A week later, the movie broke the box office record for this quarter, reaching ticket sales of over 1 billion while still rising. On the seventh night of the new year, Vincent happily invited everyone in the production crew to a good meal, and whoever was free attended the gathering. Since Julian and Jesse had declared their relationship, they went there together without caring about public scrutiny. Director Cooper, the box office sales are beyond our imaginations. This is amazing. That's right. The results have surpassed my expectations, and Jesse is made popular by the movie. She was also elated at the results, but she was not looking forward to acting anymore because she knew she would not have been interested in participating if Julian had not been the male protagonist. Therefore, she decided that she would focus on being Mrs. Gilmore from then on. As of now, we should be looking forward to the award ceremony that is going to be held in three months. I think Julian and Jesse will win a few grand awards. Of course, Jesse was looking forward to the award ceremony. It would mean a lot to her if she could win a trophy. Despite not being a casual drinker, she decided to try all sorts of alcohol, including white wine, red wine, and cocktails for this great occasion. When Julian returned from his trip to the bathroom, she was already drunk. No one is to toast her again. He was a little worried, so he warned the others. A few who did not have the chance to toast with Jesse eventually gave up on the idea. Just watching Julian dote on his wife was enough for them to feel jealous of her. It seemed like she must have done a lot in her previous life to be able to become his girlfriend. Perhaps during her last lifetime, she spent all her days gathering merits, which was why she could meet Julian in this lifetime and get pampered like a child.
I'm not drunk. I'm perfectly sober. Jessie stubbornly argued while raising her chin and taking the initiative to raise her glass. Let me give a toast to all of you. Thank you all for taking such good care of me on set. Following that, everyone raised their glasses and responded to her. Only the man sitting beside her looked frustrated and grabbed her glass away when she raised it to her lips before downing it himself. She blinked her huge eyes, utterly confused. Why is this guy stealing my drink? That's all for today. Everyone, please head back early and get some rest. Once Julian finished his words, he rose to his feet and was ready to leave. I'm bringing her home and never letting her drink alcohol again. No, I don't want to go home. Jesse was having fun with others and still wanted to be with them. We're going karaoke later. Young Master Julian, would you like to join us? One of the female assistants asked. Senselessly, when Jesse, whom Julian had just pulled into his embrace, heard they were going to karaoke, she immediately raised her hand. I do. I wanna go. No, you can't, he ordered. I don't want to go home, so I must go karaoke. Julian, please. Since Jesse was drunk, she acted like a child and was more stubborn than usual. The female assistant immediately sensed that she should not have said that and looked terrified as she looked at him. Do you want to go? In the end, Julian compromised. Yes, I want to. I want to hear you sing. With lips curled into a smile, Jesse looked at him expectantly. Fine, let's go. He agreed to her request, resulting in the assistant's relief. Oh my gosh, that was so terrifying. I thought I would get scolded by young Master Julian for sure. Subsequently, Jesse leaned half of her weight against Julian as they walked out of the restaurant. When they entered the car, she was still in high spirits and was looking forward to hearing him sing later. At that moment, Harper played a song on the radio, which was Jessie's favorite. Since the alcohol boosted her courage, she was not reserved anymore and began singing along to the radio. Her voice filled the car as she sang. Excitedly, while looking at the woman beside him, Julian decided that she was not allowed to drink alcoholic drinks when he was not around. Her current behavior was not only lovely but also sexy. Her hair was tied behind her head, revealing her charming face rich with emotions and a sense of rebellion. Chapter 1774 Lunch at Queenie's Place Julian was not sure how many times he had gulped. I shouldn't have agreed to let her go karaoke. Instead, I should have brought her home so that she could exert her excitement on me. If he were to change his mind now, she would probably throw a tantrum, so he could only suppress his urge and accompany her to the karaoke. When they arrived at the luxurious private room, they began to choose a few songs to sing. Jessie and a female assistant chose the song she had been singing inside the car earlier, and they both piped happily. Since her voice already sounded pleasant to the ears, it sounded even more melodious when she sang. However, she was a little tone deaf and was singing off key. Julian's lips curled into a smile without him knowing, and the affection in his eyes was unmistakable when he looked at her. After the song ended, shyness overcame her, probably because she had sobered up a little. She then raced over to Julian and sat beside him. He snaked his long arms around her waist, which made her look up at him to ask, What song would you like to sing? At that moment, the female assistant came over and notified them, I've selected a song for young Master Julian. Hearing that, Jesse nodded in anticipation. Okay. By now, she had indeed sobered up and was listening to the others sing. Then, her eyes landed on the beer glass on the table before she reached over. Immediately, the man beside her enveloped her in his embrace while refusing in his raspy voice. You can't drink. Anymore tonight. She turned to look at him with pitiful eyes and knew she could not drink anymore. Following that, he grabbed a glass of water and handed it to the girl, who drank it obediently like a child with strict parents. Finally, it was Julian's turn to sing. The assistant had chosen a romantic song, and it made everyone's heart flutter. As he descanted in his attractive voice. Meanwhile, Jesse was immersed in his voice. She previously listened to the soundtrack for his movie that he sang. And she loved every second of it. I put him on replay all the time. 
He's such an all-rounded artist. Jesse, go give young master Julian a hug. Lexi nudged her. Hearing that, she could not help but feel shy while heading over to embrace him. In reciprocation, he held her hand. And looked at her gently while finishing the rest of the song. Her heart fluttered, and she felt extremely shy yet. Touched. Once he finished his karaoke, both of them returned to their seats. On their way home, Jesse leaned into Julian's arm while relishing her pleasant day. The good news was that their movie left the other movies dusty in box office sales and acquired a highly satisfactory result. That night, the last of her drunken state was left for her man, for she was even more seductive than usual. It was not until 2 a.m. that they finally stopped their activities. Early the following morning, she received a call from Queenie, who invited the couple to her house. In the afternoon, both couples were sitting opposite each other while enjoying a pleasant lunch. Queenie had an obvious pregnancy vibe, and her baby bump was also slightly showing. After lunch, the two men sat aside and talked about their matters while the two sisters went upstairs to have a girl's talk. Have you decided on an engagement date? Or maybe getting married right away? Queenie asked. I think we're doing just fine. I feel free while dating him, Jesse answered, clearly not anxious about getting married. Well, since you put it that way, let's not worry about this until you're ready. Queenie agreed. I want to at least wait until my nephew is born. After Jesse said that, she gently caressed Queenie's belly. When? Will we start feeling fetal movement? Soon. It's supposed to begin around the fourth month. Queenie also looked forward to it, the magical touch from her future newborn. After having dinner, Jesse and Julian stayed until 8 p.m. and left. The two had agreed to pay a visit to the orphanage the next day, and Jesse would take five million from her signing bonus and donate it to them. Moreover, the orphanage had managed to get finer treatment and would soon be moving to a new place. When they arrived at the orphanage, Julian felt a pang in his heart when he saw the place she grew up at. It turns out that she was living a poor life before returning to the Silverstein family. Yet, she constantly relays her kindness and determination to the other children at the orphanage. The director said she has always been a role model for other children. Chapter 1775 Jesse's Advertisement Shoot When it was time for them to head home, Jesse gathered all the gifts she received from the children and put them in a box to bring home with her. Distressed, Julian embraced her before kissing her. She blinked her eyes at him. What's the matter? Nothing. He could not put his love for her into words, but he knew he was deeply in love with her. The start of a new year meant new beginnings. Jessie had made a name for herself and was so popular that an international brand chose her to be the global spokesperson for their perfume ad with an endorsement fee of two billion. This was the first time she had ever been a spokesperson for anything, so she was unaware of how others were jealous of her. She was a newly debuted celebrity who had only appeared in one film and was now chosen to be the global spokesperson for a multinational corporation. Her popularity, along with Julian's, skyrocketed, and the fans adored her. While some celebrities had dark histories that could not be revealed, Jessie's past made them feel more sympathetic toward her as they got to know her. They found out that she got lost at a young age and was admitted into an orphanage, where she had to independently earn money for herself when she reached 18. She played cameo roles and stunt doubles for a living, and she gave all the money she earned to the orphanage for the betterment of the children there. As for her, she stayed in a cheap hotel and ate bread daily. Later, she discovered that she was the second young lady of a wealthy family that owned a hundred-year-old brand. Therefore, how could such a hard-working and determined celebrity not be famous? Her past and personality made the fans feel distressed for her, but they also liked her even more and wished that she could participate in more roles. The internet was also filled with supportive comments when she was announced as the spokesperson. Later during a press conference, Jessie revealed that two-thirds of her endorsement fee would be donated to charity organizations so that they could be used to assist more children in need. If it had been another celebrity, the 
public might have deemed her altruism as an act, but that was not the case for her. Her husband was a rich, well, known actor, and her family owned a hundred-year-old brand worth 70 billion, which meant she was not short of money. That was why many believed that her donations were genuine. Also, the public discovered that while other celebrities would show off their luxuries, the clothes Jessie wore on camera were ordinary clothes and accessories. Still, they looked exceptionally beautiful on her. In an instant, she became the celebrity role model many fans idolized. As for Jessie herself, she was keeping a low profile, staying behind closed doors to date, cook, swim, and spend time with Julian. To her, anything done with him was meaningful. The following day was the day of her advertisement shoot. She was feeling nervous, for she had never gained such experiences before. That morning, she arrived at the shooting site in a white dress. She was met with a huge green cloth draped across the back of the studio. In addition, the shooting required her to do some wire flying, which she was skilled at. Since that morning, she had been busy with her makeup. Her final makeup was elegant and attractive, making her look like a princess. Her evening gown was also specially designed for her by the world's largest dress manufacturer. It was a gown with thousands of shimmering diamonds embedded in it, and it was the kind that only a person with the right temperament and figure could wear. However, Jessie was able to pull off that dress and look effortlessly stunning in it. Her advertisement shooting went smoothly, maybe because her lover was present at the scene. Her gaze was always twinkling and filled with light, resembling the mesmerizing galaxy. On screen, she was showing off her perfect figure, and her facial features looked flawless under the lens of the high-definition camera. The shooting began in the morning and lasted until late afternoon. The first day of shooting ended at 4 p.m. because there would be another day of shooting tomorrow. Julian, who had been accompanying her the entire time, felt bad for her because she had only eaten half of her lunch before heading off to film with a hungry stomach. However, she was as joyful as a child after the shoot. She dragged her beautiful evening dress around while pacing back and forth before him, hoping to get a compliment. Lovely. Yes, very. Do you want this dress? Though she adored this evening dress, it was only suitable for advertisement shoots and not daily occasions due to its eye-catchiness. She might even lose a diamond while wearing it, which would pain her to lose. Chapter 1776 Award for Best Actor and Actress There's no need for that. Wait for me to change. We'll be having dinner after that. Jessie had been on a diet for the commercial shooting, which resulted in her current hunger pangs. That night, Julian treated her to dinner and even ordered takeaway for her as supper. Then, March arrived in the blink of an eye, bringing two good tidings. The first one confirmed Eva was pregnant, while the second one was regarding their latest movie being nominated for an award. Even so, the award remained a mystery to them for the time being. Eva didn't expect herself to be pregnant when she traveled home for vacation. Thus, after she returned to the city, the people around her viewed her as the object of protection. Jessie was delighted when she heard such excellent news as she was expecting the birth of two children this year. One of them belonged to Queenie, while another one belonged to Eva. So far, she and Julian hadn't decided on their wedding date. After all, she was content with spending time together with him. The 24th of March was considered a big day for celebrities as the awards ceremony this year was held on the same day. It also provided the occasion to review excellent works over the year. The ceremony would give out awards to both the best actor and actress, along with other prizes to recognize the industry's accomplishments. Jesse, Julian, and the crew walked down the red carpet, bathing in the background music and the fans screaming. Soon, they walked over to the sign-in board. The instant she signed her name, he left his signature next to hers. Before drawing a heart that circled their names, his gesture didn't go unnoticed by the camera operators nearby. They immediately gave his work a close-up. His gesture was evidence of his affection for her, even if it was a simple one. After that, they walked into the ceremony hall. Even though she was merely a rookie in the industry, there relationship suggested that she would become more than that in the future.
Thus, the organizer arranged a seat for her beside him. Their name tags next to each other indicated the best wishes from the industry for the future. Couple, are you nervous about the ceremony? He gently held her hand in his. Not at all. I'm doing my best to stay calm. She shook her head, even though she was surrounded by the flashing lights. To her, there was nothing around that could ever compare with him. Therefore, she was happy even if she didn't win any award because he was the best thing that ever happened to her. The ceremony began in the crowd's nervous anticipation after the opening show. Then, the hosts announced the winners with excited voices. After that, the audience was all looking forward to the announcement of the award. Winners after the awards for both the Best Supporting Actor and Actress, followed by various awards for the Behind. The Scenes Team The most significant awards of the night were none other than the award for Best Actor and the award for Best Actress. All of them were highly anticipating the announcement of this year's winners. Next, we'll be glad to have the presidents announce the Best Actor and Actress. Please welcome Mr. Leeds and Mr. King, the hostess began with a bright smile on her face. The men got up on the stage. Both of them were holding an unopened envelope respectively. After they exchanged a few jokes, the music that followed built up the tension in the air. The audience was watching them in anticipation. Coming up next, we are going to announce the winners of the award for Best Actor and Best Actress. The winner of the award for Best Actor is Julian Gilmore, and the award for Best Actress goes to Jessie Silverstein. Jessie was overjoyed with the news of Julian as the winner when she unexpectedly heard her name. The words struck her like lightning, rendering her utterly dumbfounded for a split second as she had difficulty processing them. And doubting herself, am I hearing my name? She sought assurance from him. He took her hand. You are. Let's go. There was a stir in the audience. Several people were eyeing her enviously as he led her onto the stage, hand in hand. After all, she used to be an unassuming double for other actresses, and it was merely her first movie in her career. However, Julian, who was widely recognized as the most handsome man in the industry, was now holding her hand as they stepped onto the stage. Plus, she also won the award for Best Actress, which created a record for achieving such an accomplishment after starring in her first movie. Lisa was one of the people who couldn't contain her jealousy. She balled her fists tightly as she struggled to accept that all the good things had happened to Jesse. Chapter 1777 Queenie gave birth to a boy. There should be some backdoor dealings behind this. There's no way she could earn this award if not through connections, Lisa hissed through gritted teeth. At that exact moment, nervousness filled Jesse's heart. However, when Julian slid her palm into his, she calmed down under his touch. She was suddenly filled with overwhelming certainty that she could take things head on with him by her side. When the pair stood at the center of the stage, their mere presence practically revealed to the world that they were undoubtedly a perfect couple. The audience couldn't help but agree that they were the ideal match made for each other. Jesse, would you mind sharing what's on your mind right now? Are you happy? Are you surprised to hear you won? The award. The hostess walked over to them and asked cheerily. Jesse took over the microphone and nodded naturally. Yes, I'm indeed both thrilled and surprised. I've never considered winning an award when I came to attend the ceremony. But your movie ranked the highest grossing film of the year. So, you should have made a mental preparation for winning an award tonight, the host pressed. I never gave it more than a passing thought. After all, the movie only became a success mainly due to the director, the team behind it, and all the other staff involved in the movie. Once she answered, the host directed their attention at Julian and asked, Julian, what about you? What's your favorite moment on the stage? The best moment will be nothing but standing by Miss Silverstein's side when she receives the award. Julian didn't hesitate to answer. The host let out a chuckle before teasing, it seems like winning the award yourself is second to accompanying Miss Silverstein to receive the award on your list. The envious eyes of the audience were glued to Jesse. The best actor, Julian, made it clear that he was merely her companion on the stage tonight. Therefore, her most outstanding achievement tonight was never getting an award. 
but having him by her side for the rest of her life. Heat rushed to her face, and she pursed her cherry red lips at his words. However, before she could dwell on it, the hostess shot another question at her, Miss Silverstein, may I ask, do you have any plans for the future? Jessie got lost in a train of thought but couldn't think of a satisfactory answer. Then, she turned to Julian on the side. To seek his help, only to see the man smiling at her. Isn't it getting married? Her cheeks immediately flushed crimson at his reminder. Finally, she nodded firmly and told the hostess, he's right. I'm taking my time to enjoy dating before I get married. If so, is Miss Silverstein perhaps suggesting that you're marrying Mr. Gilmore? Jessie nodded the second time with pure bliss spread across her face. Yes, it's him. The award ceremony no longer held its significance when it became a place where every audience witnessed. Jessie and Julian's strong affection for each other. It was a starry night, filled with stars twinkling from the sky and stars attending the awards ceremony. By the time they arrived home, it was already 11.30 p.m. After a bath, Jessie changed into her comfy pajamas and took the opportunity to finally relax. The stiffness in her shoulders had never once disappeared during the ceremony due to her nervousness about being one of the participants tonight. A pair of hands reached behind her and kneaded her stiff muscles just when she tried to massage the soreness out of her shoulders. She fluttered her eyes shut in comfort, leaned into his touch, and enjoyed his hands massaging her shoulders as a faint smile painted across her lips. Julian was captivated by her beauty tonight. After he ensured she had finally let loose of all the stress, he stood still behind the couch and leaned down to kiss her soft, red lips. The kiss drew a moan out of her, which made her shyness reach its peak due to their intimacy. That's not how you kiss. Nevertheless, there was no doubt that the man was a good kisser, and she couldn't tear herself away from his ministrations. Soon, he bent down to carry her in his arms and returned to the room. After the award ceremony, Julian turned down all job offers and took Jessie on a trip abroad. They spent quality time together without worrying about their careers and other trivial matters. Then, July approached in a blink of an eye, bringing Queenie's due date closer day by day. Frankly, after she had experienced the pregnancy for months, she couldn't help but feel that it was finally her time to give birth to her child. Just as expected, Queenie gave birth to the youngest son of the Manson family through a C-section, who weighed seven pounds at birth. The baby boy clenched his fists as his wail resounded through the room, which thoroughly amazed the nurses in the delivery room. It was their first time seeing a newborn with such delicate features yet a very healthy set of lungs. Still, judging by his parents' looks, it was only natural that the child would eventually grow into a handsome young man in the future. Both elders of the Manson family and the Silverstein family were glad to receive the news. After all, good tidings of the mother and the child being in excellent health were the best information they would ever hope for. Chapter 1778 Jared was injured in the accident. Julian and Jesse had already embarked on their trip back to the country to attend the baby shower. Things were a little hectic for the new parents, especially considering the latest addition to the family. However, three days later, Anastasia and Elliot visited them. After all, Queenie needed a friend to talk to and relieve any postpartum anxiety she might have hidden in her heart. Anastasia was akin to an older sister to Queenie. They talked about everything and anything that needed to be taken care of after childbirth. Anastasia's company also had the intended effect of soothing Queenie, who was experiencing hormonal changes after her delivery, and kept Queenie in a good mood, so she could raise her child without worries. The Silverstein family and the Manson family elders were more than delighted to welcome the new member into their families. The baby shower was held in a month, and they had a tacit understanding of making it as grand as possible. Jessie was overjoyed to see her healthy nephew. She held him carefully in her arms most of the time and was reluctant to let him go. Julian attempted to do the same, but he felt as though his limbs weren't listening to his brain. Because no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't manage to position his arms right to hold the baby. Nigel. 
who watched the scene unfold on the side the whole time, couldn't help but step in and demonstrate the correct way to hold a baby himself. You need to learn. Maybe you'll be doing the same in two years, Nigel teased. Julian envied Nigel for that and was looking forward to the day when he got to marry Jesse. He proposed to Jesse when they traveled abroad, and she accepted. Thus, they returned to the country to discuss the wedding with their parents. The elders of the Gilmore family and the Silverstein family worked together and chose a date in October, which was an auspicious day for the wedding. Since Julian was a famous actor with a considerable fanbase, he kept the wedding small and secret. Nonetheless, some of the wedding photos he deigned to reveal remained the top trending topic on Twitter for a whole month. Finally, the group heard from Eva and Louis and received another fantastic piece of news in November, which was the birth of their son. He was the designated heir of the Gilmore family. Since then, Louis had gone all out to lavish his wife and son with love. In the evening, the lights illuminated Averna, the most prosperous city in the east. The building of Presgrave Group stood high above the other city landmarks and attractions around it like a king. It made itself a magnificent view in the evening of the early winter. Elliot had kept a low profile over the recent years. He decided to focus on his family and made them his number. One priority, but his business empire was thriving under his governance. To him and Anastasia, the family would always be his priority. His business and everything else would only come. After, not before, someday during the early winter, Jared, the young master of the Presgrave family, had just finished his usual fencing practice. He got ready to go home for dinner while a security team designated to escort him was waiting. Downstairs, he got in the car and wore his earplugs out of habit before closing his eyes for a short nap. Even though he was only 10 years old, he had set his life goal, which was to inherit his father's company in the future and protect his family. Thus, he looked more mature and sophisticated compared to the children of his age. Perhaps his wish came true as his features began to reveal a hint of him gradually growing into a young adult despite being so young. Alas, the danger was closing in from behind under the cover of the night. A car without a license plate slowly approached them. A man poked his head out of the sunroof and aimed the rocket launcher in his hands at the convoy in front of him. The enemies struck the convoy on the road without warning. The missile sent one of the three black cars in motion, flipping over before the blast spread to the other two cars. The first car rolled down the road amidst the explosion, before it crashed into a lamppost and stopped. The windows shattered due to the blast and revealed the passengers inside, but their fate remained unknown. A few injured people swiftly got down from the two other black cars, which were affected by the blast, and shouted at each other, the young master is still in there. We need to save him. After that, the bodyguards rushed simultaneously toward the flipped black car and wrenched the door open with abandon. They found Jared in a state that blood smeared all over his face when they got him out of the passenger seats. They also managed to drag the bodyguard, who drove the car, out of the driver's seat, but he had already passed away. Young master is breathing. We have to bring him to the hospital immediately. One of the bodyguards barked the order at his companions before rushing toward the black car on the roadside. The other four surviving bodyguards didn't waste any time carrying Jared to the car and making a break for the hospital. Regardless, they hurriedly reported the situation to Elliot and Anastasia on the way to the hospital. After learning the bad news, she almost passed out in her husband's arms. On the contrary, although Jared's accident unnerved him, Elliot still forced himself to calm down before rushing to the hospital with his wife in tow. Chapter 1779 A Heart Transplant Meanwhile, at Presgrave Hospital, the director, the associate director, and the rest of the head doctors were all gathered at the entrance of the building. They were there to welcome the car that the young master of the Presgrave family was in. Soon enough, the black car sped over to the entrance and stopped before the bodyguard. Carefully carried the boy out of the car and onto a stretcher. Save him, the bodyguard cried with tears in his eyes. The doctors who had been assigned to the case hurried forward and wheeled the boy to the emergency room. The 
Director ran along with them as he gave out orders to the nurses to treat the bodyguards' wounds. After that, he got the staff to send the two ice-cold bodies into the mortuary. No one could have foreseen that the Presgrave family would be attacked. It wasn't certain if young Master Presgrave, who was only ten years old, would survive the attack. About ten minutes later, Elliot charged toward the emergency room with Anastasia following behind him. A female bodyguard had to support Anastasia so that she didn't fall. Her cheeks were soaked with tears. Upon hearing the news that the bodyguards in the driver and passenger seats had died on the spot, Anastasia's face was drained of color. She looked as if she was about to pass out. Elliot gathered the four other bodyguards to ask them about the incident. I'm sorry, President Presgrave. We didn't sense any danger at first. It was just a regular jeep. Then, a rocket-like explosive was hurled directly toward the other car. The whole car was thrown up into the air before it flipped and caught on fire. We felt the impact of the explosion, even from our car. The whole place was a mess. We immediately ran over to save young master. Presgrave, and he was still breathing when we got him out, one of the bodyguards explained. Was he badly injured? Elliot asked. He had a wound on his forehead, but there were no other obvious wounds on him. But, we're not sure if he. The bodyguard muttered. Elliot's entire figure was shuddering, regardless of how much he tried to remain calm, he. Simply couldn't bring himself to accept what had happened to his son. At that very moment, a doctor rushed out of. The emergency room. President Presgrave, sir, young master Presgrave needs a heart transplant. We have to contact all of the hospitals in town or any other hospital in the country to find a suitable match. We need it within 24 hours, the doctor said to both Elliot and the director. Elliot watched as the director pulled his phone out and started contacting all his connections. He sent out the news of what had happened and started asking for a suitable heart to save a child whose life was in danger. When Anastasia heard that her son required a heart transplant, she collapsed into tears once more. At that moment, she desperately wished that she could sacrifice her life in exchange for her son's, just so that he could survive. After the directors made a few calls, he managed to get the news out to most of the hospitals. A married couple was staring at a document placed in front of them in a hospital in Averna. The woman let out a long sigh. Would we have had to spend all this money if it weren't for your sister? She muttered. Tears were welling up in the man's eyes. Stop with your harsh words. We can't save Nick anymore, he uttered. The doctor already told us that there was no hope for Nick a week ago, but you were the one who insisted on keeping him on life support. What's the purpose of that? We've spent over 10,000 on his stay in the ICU. What was all of that money for? I'd rather spend the money on someone alive. The woman responded in a sharp tone before. She gladly put her signature on the paper. However, right when they were about to leave the hospital, a doctor hurried out to stop them in their tracks. Please hold on. We have an emergency situation that we'd like to talk to you guys about, the doctor said. What's the emergency? Can we still save Nick? The man asked. Well, there's a 10-year-old who just got into a car accident in town, and he desperately needs a heart transplant. At this point, we will no longer be able to keep Nick alive. Would you guys be willing to donate his heart? The woman's eyes lit up when she heard the doctor's words. This is a good deed we're doing. Let's do it, she uttered. As she held onto her husband's arm. The man thought about it for a moment before he let out a sigh. Fine, I guess it's good that we get to save someone else's life. It'll be good karma for Nick, too. I hope he'll find greater peace wherever he is. At that point, the man didn't know that his decision had saved a whole family. When the director received the news, Elliot and Anastasia were still with him. They received the good news just 30 minutes after announcing that they needed a transplant. They heard that there was a boy who had been brain dead for nearly two weeks and that the boy's family had just signed the papers to take the boy off life support. Coincidentally, the hospital hadn't taken the boy off life support yet, so the staff had asked for the family's consent to donate the boy's heart and received it. 
Chapter 1780 Gratitude Tears streamed down Elliot's cheeks as well. The Presgrave family will forever be indebted to this family of strangers. We have to repay their kindness, he thought. Anastasia had the same thought in her mind as well. About an hour later, a total of three cars escorted a vehicle over to the hospital. In the vehicle was the heart that young master Elliot needed to survive. The young boy was hurried into the surgical theater for a heart transplant. About three hours later, the surgery was an official success, and young Master Elliot's life was no longer in danger. Elliot sent a gift to express his gratitude to the family that had helped them. Meanwhile, the other family left the hospital after they signed the necessary documents. Zach looked especially drained after he had finally said his last goodbyes to his sister's son, Nick. Zack brought his wife home, and they were greeted by two girls who were waiting for them in the hall. One of the girls was their daughter, while the other girl was skinnier and paler. However, she had a pair of bright eyes that made her look pretty. The husband and wife had just got home when they noticed a car stopping outside their house. A middle-aged man stepped out of the vehicle to hand them a special gift. Mr. Zach Lore and Ms. Olivia Fraser, I'm here to deliver a gift of appreciation on behalf of my boss. We'd all like to thank you for saving our young master. What's the gift? Olivia's eyes lit up immediately. She had already noticed how expensive the car was and how well-dressed the middle-aged man was. The man pulled out an envelope. There's a card in here. Its password is 123,456, and there's a sum of 100 million in here. This is a thank you gift from my boss, the man explained. What? How? Much did you say is inside? Olivia's eyes looked like they were about to fall out of her sockets. One hundred million, the man replied patiently. Zach was just as shocked to hear this. He hadn't expected his nephew to contribute to the family even through his death. I can't believe we're getting one hundred million for this. H how could this be? Why not? Nick is our family, he sacrificed his life to save another boy's life. This is a big deal, you know. Olivia was worried that her husband would reject the money, so she practically snatched the envelope from the man. Thank you. Please help us to thank your boss. If you don't see these signs, she doesn't love you does my ex want. The most memorable movie character deaths eight pioneering women in science. If you face any issues in the future, you can contact this number. We'll always be around to help. The man handed Olivia a name card, and she took it immediately. Are you sure that you can help with anything at all? Of course. I'll make sure to save this number, then. Olivia was on cloud nine. Drive safe. After the man left, Olivia let out a booming laugh as she threw her arms around her. Husband. We're rich, darling. We're rich. We have 100 million. Meanwhile, the young girl sitting on the couch stared at them with sorrow. What did you guys do to my brother? Why did that man give you so much money? It's none of your business. Stop asking questions, Olivia snapped. She then pulled her husband to a corner. We'll be the only ones who know about this, you hear me? We can't let that young brat find out about it. Otherwise, she's going to ask for a share of the money when she grows up, Olivia hissed. Zack took a glance at the girl who was sitting in a corner. Even though he was her biological uncle, he felt as if he had been totally blinded by the wealth that had just befallen him. He was afraid that the girl would want to snatch his money away as well. Okay, he promised his wife. We're really rich this time. We'll never finish all this money. At that thought, Olivia turned to look at her daughter and her skinny, frail niece. You'll live with us from now on. You need to be a good girl, do you understand? She spat at the skinnier child. I want my brother. The girl started crying. Your brother's sick. You won't get to see him anymore, the other young girl told the skinnier one. My brother's not gone. He's coming back, the skinny girl cried. When Olivia first took the two children in, she had considered how she didn't have a son of her own. That thought made her feel more reluctant to care for the two kids that came from her husband's sister's family. It seems like the heavens are taking away my problems now. Chapter 1781 16 years later. There's only this girl left in their family, and I'm now gifted with so much money. 
This money must be spent on my own daughter for her to live well. As for this niece, oh, there's this Aunt Jessica who had earlier offered to look after Ellie. I have to send this burden of ours, Ellie, away. I'm not spending even a cent on her. Hubby, let's send Ellie to Aunt Jessica. I don't think that's a good idea. Aunt Jessica is aging and she lives alone. How on earth is she going to raise a kid? Ellie is not young anymore, what more does your aunt need to do? Let's do it this way, we'll pay Aunt Jessica too. Thousand every month for her to take care of Ellie. After all, the longer Ellie stays with us, the more details she will get to know as she gets older. When that happens, she will most likely fight for the money. Olivia was now solely concerned with keeping the money all to herself. Her words made Connor think twice. My wife is right. Ellie will grow up one day, and if she learned that we approved the donation, things will get out of hand. Fine, let me talk to Aunt Jessica regarding this. Jared, who had been unconscious for the previous three days, began to stir in Presgrave Hospital. Although his head was bandaged, he was conscious and eventually understood what was happening when he learned that his heart was a transplant. Tori Spelling's confession dropped even. Green's jaw. Nasty skeletons in hotels seemingly spotless. Closets. For him, realizing that the heart beating within his body belonged to someone else was an indescribable sensation. You're awake at last, Jared. You almost scared me to death. Anastasia cried so much that she almost had her eyes blind from all the crying. Looking at her son who had finally awakened, she felt as though she was the one who had a close call to death. Jared glanced at Anastasia, feeling bad that he had caused her to worry, as he said, I'm sorry, Mom, for making you worry. A wave of guilt swept over him as he realized how anxious his family was. It's okay. I'm happy now that you're fine. I won't cry anymore. Anastasia then bent down and kissed Jared on the forehead. She did not want her sorrow to affect her son who had just awoken. She knew he had suffered too. Five days after the crash, Elliot learned what caused it. It was planned by a foreign competitor who wanted to exact revenge on the Presgrave group for stealing away their business interests. Shortly after Elliot learned this knowledge, a disaster occurred in the middle of the open seas. The miscreant with the temerity to touch Elliot's son vanished from existence. This was exactly Elliot's style. But despite so, he was unable to quell his anger. He went even further to ensure that the entire sinner's clan would never be seen in the world. As Jared required a quiet place to recuperate, Elliot's entire family migrated to a tranquil manor abroad and had since resided there. These actresses will make you rethink good and evil. How traditional wedding outfits look around the world. Sixteen years later, a young, attractive figure could be seen sitting at the president's desk in the president's office. He then stood to his feet and gazed out the floor-to-ceiling window. His captivating appearance was a gift from God. With the sun rays accentuating his aquiline nose and enhancing his facial contours, thin lips, and fair forehead as seen through his combed-up fringes, Jared, who turned 26 this year, completely inherited his father's genes. He stood close to 1.87 meters tall and exuded an elegant aura, which was how a son of a noble family would appear. Mr. Presgrave, the documents required for the board meeting are ready. You can go now. Okay. Jared had spent the previous years living and studying overseas and had rarely returned, but this time, he would have more time to stay in the country. Despite his young age, he had a comparable capability to his father. As a result, he was now in charge of running the whole Presgrave group while his parents focused on caring for his younger sister. At the same time, a figure who had just returned from studying abroad was grandly greeted. Another woman laden with jewelry rushed up to hug the woman as soon as she emerged from the airport wearing only branded clothing. From head to toe, my daughter, you're back at last. It was Olivia Fraser, hugging her daughter, Selena, who had been studying abroad for the past four years. This daughter of hers, having a beautiful appearance and obtaining foreign degrees, had made Olivia proud. Olivia was certain that Selena would have a bright future ahead. Mom, I'm running out of money again. Transfer some to me. 
Chapter 1782 Living Like a Princess Soon later, Olivia drove her Mercedes-Benz into a basement car park in Avernus high-end residential area and stopped it in a luxurious parking space. Selena got out of the car. Behaving just like a princess, she did not pick up any of her belongings and instead waited for her mother to carry everything for her. This resulted in Olivia spoiling Selena since she was young as if she were truly a princess from a royal family. Let's have something special tonight, mom. Sure, pick whatever you like, Olivia agreed right away. Selena then trailed behind Olivia. She appeared dissatisfied with and looked down upon everything in the country. Perhaps because she had lived abroad for the previous years. That's perfectly fine. Our family does not require money anyway. I don't want you to suffer outside too, Olivia. Responded lovingly. That evening, Connor and Olivia took Selena out to a fancy dinner before visiting a few designer stores to get their attire for the wedding the following day. Their total expenditure for the night itself came up to more than one hundred thousand. This was what Selena had always been curious about. According to what she had recalled, their family lived in a run-down alley when she was seven. However, they moved into a big mansion subsequently, and when she graduated from high school, her parents immediately sent her abroad to study when she failed to get into a local university. Not only that, but the university she attended abroad was also one which was reputable, all thanks to her parents' connections. At that moment, everyone in her high school was envious of her. She felt that her parents possessed a mystical ability that allowed them to instantly make their entire family rich. She had previously asked Olivia about this, but Olivia did not tell her the truth and continued to indulge her every wish. As time passed, Selena gradually developed the mannerisms and habits of the wealthy and lived just like a lady who was born with a silver spoon. The next day morning, Olivia had arranged for a makeup artist to come to their house to doll up both Selena and herself. Selena wore a six-figure gown, and because she had undergone some minor cosmetic surgery abroad, she truly appeared beautiful. Under the power of money as well, she shed her prior persona as a poor, disheveled lady and appeared to be a wealthy and noble woman. Connor had begun investing recently and Lady Luck had also been kind to him too as he managed to earn a few million solely from investments. Their entire family then boarded the posh car Connor had just purchased and made their way to the hotel where the wedding was hosted. The moment Olivia appeared in the hall, all of their relatives and friends greeted her respectfully, worrying that any delay would annoy her. Wow, this is Selena, right? She looks just like a celebrity. That's right. Such a beautiful lady. You're so blessed, Olivia, to have such a beautiful daughter. Of course, she is. Furthermore, Selena is an international graduate from a world-known university. That's incredible. Hearing all the compliments, Selena couldn't help but raise her chin proudly. She knew she merited all of these praises. She was also aware that many young guys in the hall were placing their attention on her, but she found all these men ridiculous. She would never take a fancy to these ordinary men. Her ideal life partner would undoubtedly be a member of the elite and the most influential group. She followed her mother to the front seats, sat down, and then started scrolling through her phone while acting. Oblivious to everyone else, Olivia, on the other hand, looked around the room before turning to the woman with gray hair seated next to her and asked, where is Ellie, Aunt Jessica? Is she not coming? Chapter 1783 Ellen Reese. Ellie should be back soon, and she's probably on her way. She had to change her shifts to make it here today. Jessica Aguirre said. She was the elderly woman who had adopted Ellen Reese. When Ellen's name was mentioned, Selena's head shot up, and a flash of superiority lit up her eyes. She had nothing better to do and was curious to see what Ellen, whom she had once despised, had become. Selena despised Ellen because her family had fostered Ellen and her brother for a year when they were young. Despite her young age, Selena never overcame her animosity toward Ellen, especially after she realized Ellen had a beautiful doll that she had always wanted. However, Ellen never gave it to her, and Selena hid it, which resulted in 
her father spanking her. Although her only recollection of Ellen was from their childhood, the vengeful nature of her character meant that she would not let the memories fade. She was relieved that Ellen's brother had died of illness. Because otherwise, she would despise them even more. Mom, what is Ellen doing now? Selena asked curiously. Olivia turned to ask Jessica, what has Ellie been up to recently? She currently works part-time at a cafe. Moreover, she recently graduated but has yet to find a suitable job. A worried look crossed Jessica's face as she answered. Selena snickered when she heard that. So, she's working part-time in a cafe, huh? I was hoping she'd do better than that. After the newlyweds made their grand entrance, the guests were treated to a few toasts before being seated for the meal. At the same time, a young lady hopped off a bus that had pulled up to the bus station near the hotel, checked the time, and ran to the hotel. Although she was still dressed in her waitress uniform, she managed to exude a cool demeanor despite the sweltering heat. The breeze blew her bangs and highlighted her attractive face. Slightly out of breath, she entered the elevator and soon arrived in the hall. She looked around for a seat, but an elder ushered her to a seat with the directors. With a bright grin, Ellen made her way to her seat while attracting the attention of several young men as she passed by. She radiated an air of mystic authority that drew people to her like moths to a flame. Then, she affectionately embraced Jessica before taking a seat beside her. Afterward, Jessica began caring for her as though she were her own child, pouring her drinks and setting out her cutlery. However, Selena's attention was on Ellen as soon as she walked in, but Ellen still hadn't noticed her. Selena couldn't help but feel superior at seeing Ellen in her cheap uniform. A sudden thought prompted Jessica to pat Ellen on the shoulder and exclaim, Ellie, Aunt Olivia and Selena are here. 2. When Ellen turned around, she spotted Olivia and Selena, so she flashed them a bright smile and greeted them as if they were strangers. Aunt Olivia and Selena, it's been a while. Olivia pretended to greet her amiably. It's been a while. Come by whenever you have time. She felt she had no choice but to put on an air of seniority in social situations. Moreover, she had never cared about Ellen's daily life since she was a child. Olivia once broached the subject of providing Ellen's living expenses with her husband. Still, she abandoned the plan. Six months after learning that Jessica's monthly pension of 3000 was sufficient to support Ellen. Nevertheless, every time Jessica saw them, she never failed to thank them for offering them living expenses for six months. Furthermore, she would bring it up to everyone she knew. Sure, Ellen replied with a smile. Still, she did not dare go to her uncle's house because it was much too lavish for her, and she feared she would be subjected to undue pressure if she did. This is Selena, Olivia proudly introduced her daughter to Ellen as a way of bragging. Ellen and her daughter were roughly the same age, but Ellen was still struggling at the base of the pyramid, while her daughter had a bright future ahead of her. She managed to fast track to elite society with little effort. Then, Selena glanced at Ellen while propping her chin in the palm of her right hand, and her eyes glowed with surprise. She did not expect Ellen to become a beautiful young lady because of Ellen's scrawny and malnourished appearance as a child. However, given Ellen's inherent beauty, minimal makeup would suffice to transform her into a stunning woman. Chapter 1784 Flawless Skin Selena couldn't help but feel resentful. My skin is flawless, and its radiance can only be attained through various beauty products, but look at her poor appearance. I wonder if she could afford a moisturizer, which costs one hundred. Nevertheless, Ellen has much healthier and more radiant skin than I do. Her skin is smooth and supple, like a baby's, and there is not the slightest sign of a blemish anywhere on her face. That's so unfair. At the end of the meal, Connor approached Ellen, handed her a card, and said, Ellie, there's a hundred thousand in this card. Keep it for yourself and Aunt Jessica. Uncle Connor, I appreciate it, but I'm working to make a living, and I'm not short on cash. The moment he made the offer, she firmly shook her head and declined. She would never accept such a substantial sum of money from him. The passage of time profoundly impacted his personality, and he became considerably magnanimous. 
seeing his sister's daughter struggle to make a living while he and his family had no financial concerns, he sincerely desired to assist Ellen. When Olivia went looking for him so they could leave, she found him with a card in his hand and Ellen standing in front of him. Then, she swiftly approached them and asked, Connor, let's go home. What's with that card? She shot him a warning glance, knowing that her husband was presumably trying to give Ellen money, which she forbade. Celebrities embody their iconic roles on the red carpet. Truth behind common myths about men, get ready to be surprised by Uncle Connor. Then, Ellen abruptly turned around and walked away. Olivia sneered, Connor, why are you being so kind and generous? You secretly gave Ellen money without informing me, didn't you? Ollie, how could you be so heartless? Who has made it possible for us to live the way we do now? Do you not feel the slightest sympathy for Ellie? Does she need our sympathy? She is 22 years old, and isn't she working diligently? She won't starve to death, she huffed angrily. We no longer share the same social standing as she does in society. Moreover, we each have our own lives, and she has her own. Therefore, we do not have to worry about her. She will deprive you of everything. You have now when she learns of what we did back then. Due to the past events, Connor's wife brainwashed him to prevent him from becoming close to his niece. Since our daughter wears designer clothing that can easily run into the tens of thousands, why can't we give Ellie some money? It breaks my heart to see her using a phone with a badly cracked screen, he responded with a sigh. What do you think she'll feel about us if she finds out that we got our comfortable lifestyle by trading her brother's heart? Aside from that, given that we were so heartless back then, what good would it do to try to atone for our sins right now? So, let's forget about it and go home. Following that, Olivia took her husband's hand and led him toward the parking lot. Meanwhile, Ellen was rushing out of the entrance when she noticed Selena standing alone. However, Selena couldn't help but call out to her. I've heard you're now working in a cafe. What's the name of the cafe? Ten accomplished female gamers throughout esports history. Eight crazy gifts that celebrities have given their better halves. It's called Indigo Brews. Stop by if you want to get a coffee. Send me the address. I might drop by, Selena uttered arrogantly. Then, let's exchange contact information. Following that, Ellen said anxiously, I gotta get back to work now. Bye. She bid Selena farewell and left, then she felt frustrated because she hadn't seen any jealousy or envy in Ellen's eyes. She has no idea how to appreciate my superiority. Her views on materialism may differ from mine, so I can't compel her to comprehend my lavish life, she muttered in dismay. At that moment, her parents' car pulled over in front of her, and she climbed inside and looked out the window. Suddenly, she noticed the central business district skyscraper, affixed with the words, Presgrave Group, gleaming in the sunlight. Then, she felt compelled to tell her mother, Mom, I aspire to work there. Olivia and Connor looked at the Presgrave Group building in unison. She smiled as she asked her daughter, Do you want to work there? Yeah, but I'm not sure I can. As far as I know, they don't actively seek new employees, and their entry requirements are quite high. Chapter 1785 Pull Some Strings Tell your dad to pull some strings for you. You can definitely get in with your talent, Olivia confidently suggested to her daughter. Really? Dad, can you really pull some strings for me? Then, assign me a position inside right away. When Selena heard that, she was pleasantly surprised because she had hoped to find a job and a potential romantic interest in the company. Then, Connor nodded. Sure, I'll figure something out so you can get in. She couldn't help but put her hands on her chest in excitement. If I could join the Presgrave group, my classmates would be green with envy. The following afternoon, Selena borrowed the car from her father and drove to the cafe where Ellen worked. She was intrigued by Ellen's place of employment and wished Ellen would feel envious of her. Meanwhile, Ellen was working in the cafe when she noticed Selena walk in, so she approached her and greeted her. Warmly, Lena, I'm surprised to see you here. 
Selena sat down while Ellen took her order, and then she deliberately picked up the menu to flaunt the massive diamond ring. Then, she placed an order from the selections available. I'll have this. Sure. Hang on a moment. After Ellen had left, Selena snapped a selfie, appearing pleased with her subtle makeup. Is that your friend, Ellen? She looks like a daughter from a wealthy family. She is my cousin, my uncle's daughter. Whoa, you have a wealthy uncle. Do you notice the timepiece on her wrist? I believe it is branded, and she appears to wear designer clothing. Ellen smiled. Yes, my uncle's family is quite wealthy. Then, why are you working in a cafe? What does it have to do with me? She found her colleague amusing. When Ellen brought the coffee over, Selena pointed to the seat across from her and said, Take a seat. Let's talk. Since the store manager was not around, Ellen sat down and conversed with her. Then, her attention was drawn to Selena's diamond ring, and she exclaimed, What an exquisite ring. Selena held out her hand, took a quick look at the ring, and then inquired, Do you know how much it costs? How much? How much do you earn monthly? Around 3,000. Then, you may need to work for five years to afford it. Selena replied with arrogance. Ellen couldn't help but bite her tongue. Wow, that's so expensive. After a while, Selena left, and because her car was parked at the entrance, the other waitress, who had returned from taking the trash outside, immediately remarked, Ellen, I can't believe your cousin's family is so wealthy. She drives a Bentley. Ah, do you know how much her diamond ring cost? Ellen asked her colleague. How much? It is equivalent to five years of our annual income. Geez, why are you so poor while your family is so wealthy? Her colleague couldn't help but wonder. Ellen shrugged and inquired, what does my cousin's family's wealth have to do with how poor I am? Of course, it does. If I have a wealthy uncle, I will do whatever it takes to work for him rather than in a cafe. Ellen responded with a bitter smile. Following her brother's passing, she recalls Connor's family distanced themselves from her. Since that day, she had never been to her uncle's home, nor had she seen him or his family. For years. Eventually, as she matured, Jessica told her that her uncle had become the wealthiest member of the family. Moreover, she envied Selena because, despite failing the college entrance exam, she could attend the best university in the world, becoming the family's crown jewel. Ellen never complained about her unfortunate circumstances because her parents died when she was a child, and she remembered her brother as the person who had always been the closest to her. However, her brother passed away due to illness. Later, Jessica cared for her as though she were her granddaughter. Ellen believed she was closest to Jessica, whereas Connor's family was only a distant relative on whom she could not rely. Soon, Ellen had finished her shift and boarded the bus home. Ellen and Jessica lived in an old house in a suburban neighborhood of the big city. Since their house was in a less than ideal area, it would never be demolished. Chapter 1786. Rely on your uncle. When Ellen returned home, she was hesitant to turn on the lights. As the light was dim, she turned on a nightlight and began cleaning the house. After Jessica informed her that macaroni and cheese would be on the menu for dinner that day, she retrieved a box from the back of the cupboard and set it to boil. One of Jessica's favorite pastimes was chatting with the other retirees in her neighborhood. Hence, she would return by 6 p.m., and Ellen would prepare dinner in advance while she awaited her return. After Ellen had finished setting the table with the cutlery, Jessica returned home. She had turned 66, and, despite her silver hair and wrinkled face, she was full of life and vitality. Ellie, is dinner ready? Grandma, did anything interesting happen today? While cooking the macaroni, Ellen engaged her in conversation. Jessica happily filled her in on the local tidbits, such as which family had been childless for years despite being married and whose daughter-in-law was going through a divorce. Ellen found it enjoyable to converse with her, because she knew it would help Jessica's memory and slow the progression of her dementia. On the other hand, Ellen mentioned how she had met Selena earlier that day at the cafe. When Jessica heard that, she let out a sigh of sympathy for Ellen. 
Both Selena and Ellen were around the same age, but Selena had the privileged life of a wealthy daughter while Ellen was forced to make do with less. Ellie, please hear me out on this. What is it? If I pass away someday, you ought to look for your uncle and move in with them. Grandma, what are you saying? You have a long life ahead of you. Ellen hurriedly stopped her from continuing. Jessica chuckled. I meant, if, silly. So, remember to go live with your uncle when the time comes. Uncle Connor has his own family. I can't live with them anymore. Ellen had never considered the possibility of such a scenario. It's better to be turned down than to have nobody to rely on. After all, Connor is your uncle, so he will not leave. You alone, Jessica spoke firmly. She was getting on in years, so naturally, she was concerned about Ellen. Ellen's eyes turned misty as she nodded. Okay, if there's one thing you're not good at, it's winning over others. If you spent more time with your uncle, you wouldn't have to suffer alongside me. Ellen pursed her lips, knowing that Jessica had suggested that for her own good, but she was content with her current situation. Grandma, this month I was awarded a bonus. So, let me take you out for a delicious meal. Nah, you need to put that cash aside for a rainy day. Then, when you marry, you will need a dowry. Jessica laughed. Ellen's pretty face flushed. Grandma, it's too soon for me to marry. I hope I live long enough to witness your wedding. I'm curious what kind of boy you'll marry. A deeper flush of redness spread across Ellen's face. Grandma, hurry and eat your dinner before it gets cold. Meanwhile, at Aguirre residence, Olivia bought a new set of clothes and wore them to show her husband. However, Connor seemed distracted, and without even looking at her, he said, you look great in them, but you shouldn't go out and spend so much money on clothing. Why not? I am delighted to spend it on them, she snorted. She was frustrated by her husband's inattention and asked, what's the matter with you lately? I wonder if Ellie has been treated unfairly. My conscience is bothering me. Then, Olivia sneered, what's the use of being sorry? We can make amends for her loss by providing financial assistance so that she does not have to endure as much suffering in her daily life. No way. Life is what you make of it, unfortunately, Ellen's life is destined to be difficult. Moreover, we have no control over it, Olivia stated sarcastically. We have not yet secured a job for our daughter. I called Mr. Wenlock, but he was away on business. When he returns, he will arrange a position for Lena. Seeing how soft-hearted Connor was, she sat beside him and persuaded him, think about it, Connor. What if? Helping Ellen leads to her becoming entangled with our family. If you lend a hand to her once, she'll be back for more. So, will she move in with us after the passing of Aunt Jessica? Worse yet, what if she chooses to live off of us for the rest of her life? If you don't give her money right now, you are telling her we are not people she can rely on. There's no harm in being ruthless sometimes, right? Chapter 1787 Ideal Type Connor was brainwashed time and time again by Olivia, and since he also valued profit, he ruthlessly neglected his niece for years. Fine. Connor had no choice but to listen to his wife and be ruthless. Due to their conversation, Olivia was no longer interested in trying on clothes anymore, so she called her daughter and reminded her to come home early. Meanwhile, Selena was hanging out with a bunch of foreign friends in a high-end bar. Selena's circle of friends were all rich kids in Averna who were open to meeting new people and going to parties. In the blink of an eye, it had been a few days since Selena returned. Today, she and her friends made an appointment to visit the golf course where Ellen happened to be. She wasn't here for fun. Instead, she was there as a cleaner. The daughter of Jessica's good friend worked as a janitor here, but she was hospitalized because she was not feeling well and couldn't ask for leave, so Jessica asked Ellen to help her out for a few days. Ellen had been working for two days in a row now, and she had also requested to take over the night shift for her cafe job so that she could make time during the day. On this day, she wore the janitor uniform and a sun hat. No one could tell that she was just a young girl. Just as she was cleaning a particular area, four fashionable young ladies walked toward her while chatting. Ellen took a glimpse at them curiously before quickly recognizing Selena. 
At the same time, Selena turned in her direction, so Ellen called out to her, Selena. Selena was looking at the scenery at first, but she was startled by the sudden call of her name. Only then did her gaze fall on the janitor. Surprisingly, the janitor turned out to be Ellen. Moreover, she was holding a garbage bag in one hand, while the other hand wearing gloves, and she was wearing an unfashionable sun hat. It was so embarrassing to watch. Do you know her, Lena? One of the girls asked curiously and took a glance at Ellen. Since when did Selena have such a bum-looking relative? Ellen felt the complicated gaze in Selena's eyes as she looked at her. Thereafter, the latter smiled and replied to her friend, No, I don't know her. Six reasons sharks are afraid of dolphins most of them will d. Nine shocking images of Ukrainian malls destroyed in Russian attack, first daughters, from cute little. Feeling as if she had been stabbed in the heart, Ellen hurriedly turned around to leave, not wanting to embarrass Selena. Selena watched Ellen's embarrassed back with a smile, and there was no trace of guilt in her eyes. Ellen almost made her lose pride in front of her friends, for goodness sake. She used to brag in front of her friends that her family was all wealthy, so it did not make sense that she had a relative who worked as a janitor. Just then, one of the girls covered her mouth and exclaimed, Oh my! Look at that man! He's so handsome! The backs of two men were facing them, and the younger one resembled a prince under the morning light. His thick raven hair was brushed backward, revealing a flawless face and sharp features. He had thick brows, a sharp nose, and beautiful lips. His overall temperament was elegant and charming. Although they were nearly thirty feet away from him, all of them were in awe of the man's good looks. Even Selena could feel her heart racing. Whether it was his temperament, figure, or his face, he was her ideal type. I wanna know him. Which family does he belong to? I don't think I have seen him before, but I can tell that he's extremely well off. He must belong to a higher class than us. How great would it be to know him? Why don't we ask for his phone number? One of the girls suggested. Then let's decide with a game. The four girls were here to take pictures of the scenery so that they could upload them online and maintain their perfect rich girl setup. Eventually, Selena lost the game. She took a deep breath, and with eyes filled with ambition and desire, she mused, if I get his number, I won't share it with anyone else. I'm going over now, she declared while combing her hair with her digits and checking her outfit. Once she was content with her preparations, she walked up to the two men. Chapter 1788 Need Help Beside the young man stood a middle-aged man. The duo was playing golf while chatting away. When Selena approached them, she heard the middle-aged man respectfully addressing the young man, Sir, it's getting late. Shall we head back? Sure. Let's leave in a few minutes. The man's voice was crisp and clear, carrying a hint of masculine charm. After he swung the golf club, Selena approached him. The middle-aged man turned to look at her and asked, Is something the matter, miss? Well, my friends and I made a bet. Whoever can get this young man's number will win the game. May I ask, if you are willing to help me out, sir? Can I get your contact number, please? As Selena raised her head, she realized that the man had such a stunning face that she dared not look him in the eye. If she did so, her heart might beat even faster, and she might even risk stuttering in her speech. Before the young man could reply, however, the middle-aged man rejected her request. Sorry, miss, we cannot allow just anyone to have his phone number. Selena couldn't help taking the opportunity to look at him and notice that the collar of his white shirt was unbuttoned, and the cuffs of his shirt were rolled up to the middle of the arms, which revealed his fair and delicate skin. He had a pair of gleaming deep-set eyes, a sharp nose, and sexy lips. When all of those aspects were combined in one frame, he looked as perfect as a sculpture. Without backing down, she boldly asked the man, Sir, please. Please help me out. In response, the man took a glimpse at her and replied indifferently, Sorry, I can't. Even his voice is charming. Though she was extremely disappointed by his response, she dared not act presumptuously anymore. She stared at the man greedily for a few seconds before turning around to leave. Let's go, sir, the middle-aged man initiated. 
When Selena returned to her friends, she had to disappoint them by telling them that she couldn't get his number. So the girls became depressed as well. They just missed out on getting to know a handsome man. But Selena was even more disappointed because she had admired the man up close. The feeling she had for him had intensified after their brief exchange. He honestly looked straight out of a comic. Ellen, on the other hand, had been picking up garbage for some time and had to drag an extremely heavy bag of garbage on the road. A buggy stopped in front of her as she struggled to drag it, and a deep male voice asked. Need help. She turned her head abruptly before widening her eyes. She felt dizzy as if being shown by the sun. Except that it was not the sun, but a man's face. And no, thank you. I can do it by myself. Ellen did not expect a handsome man would have such a kind heart. Let us give you a ride, miss. You're working too hard. After saying that, the middle-aged man got off the vehicle and helped her carry the garbage bag onto the buggy. Seeing that, Ellen thanked them with a flushed face. Don't worry about it. The young man smiled as he started scanning her before asking curiously, why are you working as a janitor here at such a young age? This is not actually my job. The daughter of my grandma's friend works here, but she fell sick, so I came over to take over her job for a few days. After Ellen finished speaking, she wrung her hands nervously. She felt uneasy by the man's stare. Involuntarily, her face turned scarlet. She would rather drag that bag of garbage alone than be scrutinized under the gaze of such a handsome man. She felt embarrassed. When they arrived at the parking spot, the middle-aged man even carried the garbage bag down for her, but when she intended to thank them for their kind act, she realized that the young man had walked away with his elegant back facing her. It made her stare blankly for a while, and when she came back to her senses, she felt quite puzzled but deep inside. She felt touched by their kindness. After ending her job, she changed into a casual outfit and left the golf club. Since buses did not stop nearby, she had to walk about 20 minutes to the nearest bus stop. While strolling on the road, she hummed a tune and enjoyed the scenery, feeling carefree. Chapter 1789 How Did We Get Rich? Right then, a Bentley drove up from behind her. Selena was in the driver's seat. Her eyes glinted with hatred when she saw Ellen. Why does she have to be around all the time? Selena pressed down on the gas pedal and sped forward. She was afraid that Ellen would see her driving the car, that would make her seem like she was a heartless person. Selena didn't want to pick Ellen up, she felt embarrassed to show her friends that she had a relative as poor as Ellen. Selena, did you say that your father's going to send you to work at Presgrave Group? Is that true? Selena's friend asked. Yeah, my father's looking for connections, Selena replied. Can you help me to get into the company too? Selena shook her head. His friend can only help me to get a job. There, you don't even need a job. You can do any other job since your family's so well off, her friend commented. Ten awesome TV series that got cancelled way too soon. An easy way to get rid of strawberry skin. Instantly. What do you know? I'm here to hunt for my future partner. I heard that tons of talented figures earn millions a year in that company. They're way better than the regular person. They're smart and rich, it'd be a plus if they are also handsome. The group of girls chuckled among themselves, they were all picturing their ideal romantic encounters. However, Selena was already hooked on the young man she had seen at the golf club earlier. That was the man she wanted to get married to. I wish I could find a way to get to know him. Ellen walked for nearly 20 minutes to get to the bus stop. It was late at night, and she felt rather sorry for herself as she stood alone at an empty bus stop. When the bus finally arrived, she got on the bus and leaned her head against the window as she felt the air conditioning against her face. She felt like a speck of dust in the universe as she looked at the bustling city outside the window. Oftentimes, she felt unworthy of being in this city. Those tall buildings and those brightly lit condominiums, I wonder what sort of people live there. I know I'm in the lowest class among all these people. Even though I graduated from university, finding a job is simply too hard. 
it's practically impossible to find a good job without having some connections. Ellen had gotten into a decent company once, but the manager kept harassing her. In the end, she had to quit her job because she was too afraid of him. She didn't have the guts to tell anyone else about this matter because she knew that no one was going to support her even if she told them about it. She didn't dare to tell her grandmother about it either, she was worried that she would make her grandmother worry and cause her grandmother's health to deteriorate. So, Ellen was like a lone kitten that was terrified yet curious about the rest of the world around her. She couldn't help but recall her brother sometimes. Her brother was the only person who had ever risked his life to protect her. From what she could remember, her brother was both bold and warm. Whenever he had good food, he made sure to share it with her, whenever he had nice toys, he would give them to her as well. However, her loving brother had left her all alone, stunning wedding outfits from all around the world. How Rosemary Oil Can Help You Achieve Your Hair Growth Goals When Ellen finally got home, she was greeted with her grandmother's warm meal. Even though it was nothing special, she felt her insides warming up as she ate the meal. Meanwhile, in the Fraser household, Selena told her mother all about how she had bumped into Ellen at the golf club. She was so disgusting. I nearly got embarrassed in front of my friends because of her, Selena complained. All right. The next time this happens, you should just pretend not to know her. She can't blame you for it. Olivia had a beauty face mask that cost $1,000 on her face, and she was enjoying herself while lying on the couch. Of course, I wouldn't make eye contact with her even if I saw her on the streets. She totally embarrassed our family. Selena had a resentful look on her face as she spoke. You should stay away from her. You don't want her bad luck to rub off on you, Olivia reminded her daughter. B. Truth was that she didn't want her daughter to get close to Ellen as she was afraid that Ellen would start pestering their family someday. If they showed enough hostility toward Ellen, then Ellen wouldn't have the guts to get too close to them. I know. Selena nodded. Mom, I have a question. How did we get so rich? Some people's families have a company that they're waiting to inherit. Do we have a company too? Chapter 1790 A Terrible Fall Beneath the beauty face mask, Olivia's expression stiffened. She turned around and looked at Selena reproachfully. Didn't I already tell you about this? Your father and I met a benefactor who provided us with a venture capital fund. Thanks to that, your father made a fortune in trading stocks. And who is that benefactor? Selena couldn't help wondering even more curiously. That benefactor will reveal himself to you if the opportunity arises, Olivia replied mysteriously. Feeling extremely curious about this person, Selena thought to herself, a benefactor who can make our entire family rich overnight must be extremely wealthy. I need to get to know him. This benefactor not only helped our family but also helped me. Without him, I would never have been able to enter such a prestigious university. Although it was tough for me to graduate with a diploma, nobody will dare to look down on me when I introduce myself in the future. Of course. Likewise, Olivia was very proud. Mom, I met a super handsome man on the field today. It's a pity I failed to get his phone number. How handsome. How should I put it? He is the kind of person who was born from true wealth. His entire body radiated with a sense of nobility and an extraordinary aura. I practically swooned on the spot when I saw him. Selena described the man. To her mother in detail, there was no restraint in her words whatsoever. If you wish to marry into a good family in the future, then you shouldn't randomly fall in love or enter a relationship with a man. Don't let those useless men take advantage of you, Olivia advised her daughter. Mom, I know what I'm doing in this regard. An ordinary person wouldn't catch my fancy anyway, Selena assured her mother. At one of the top villas along the hillside of Averna, Jared stood by the floor-to-ceiling window and stared out at the lights in the distance. He was reminiscing about all the fun things he experienced with his parents when he was younger. At the same time, he also recalled the disaster that struck him when he was 10 years old. His life nearly came to an abrupt end on that fateful day, but God had given him the chance for a second life. 
His family had been very grateful to the parents who had donated the heart to him and saved his life as a result. Even now, his family continued to help the donor's family to show their gratitude. The heart he received back then had long since merged seamlessly with his body to provide him with great health and vitality. He took off his shirt. Holding his shirt in his hand, he walked toward the bathroom. There was a visible scar on his chest that remained from the surgery he underwent back then, but the scar did not take away from the beauty of his strong figure. On the contrary, the scar added a touch of masculinity and sensuality to his character. In the early hours of the morning, Ellen was sleeping deeply when she heard her grandmother calling her name. Ellie, Ellie. She immediately bolted awake and jumped out of bed. Pushing open the door to her grandmother's room, she saw her grandmother lying on the dimly lit ground. Her grandmother had fallen down. Grandma. She screamed in horror. Hastily turning on the light, she saw her grandmother lying there motionlessly. With an ashen complexion. Then, she quickly rushed back to her room and grabbed her phone to dial the emergency number. After her grandmother was sent to the emergency room at the hospital, the nurse urged her to pay the medical fees first. She had taken out all the money she had on her, but the nurse informed her to prepare another 20000 by tomorrow morning to cover any unexpected medical expenses that might incur. Ellen was terrified and quickly contacted her great-aunt, Lilac Aguirre, for help. Unfortunately, Lilac had just recently paid for her son's wedding and had no money to spare. She told Ellen to ask her nephew, Connor, for help. Instead, at this point, Ellen had no other options left. She could only hope that her uncle would be willing to loan her 20000 to pay for her grandmother's medical expenses. Jessica Aguirre was rescued from the brink of death. Be that as it may, the doctor warned Ellen to prepare herself. For the worst, Jessica's fall had resulted in serious cardiac issues, so there was a high possibility that she would lose her life at any time. Combined with her advanced age, the possibility of saving her was low. When Ellen heard the news, she covered her mouth with her hands in horror as tears began to flow down her cheeks. She felt an absolute sense of despair and helplessness. Doctor, I have the money. Please save my grandmother no matter what, she begged the doctor. The doctor glanced at her frayed clothes and the worn-out phone clutched in her hands, but he nodded comfortingly. Of course, I will do my best. Inside the hospital ward, she accompanied her grandmother throughout the night. When 7 a.m. finally rolled around, she hurriedly left the room and dialed Connor's number. Chapter 1791 Distressed Over Family Finances When Connor received the phone call, he immediately showed concern. What? She fell. Is it serious? The doctor says that it's serious. Uncle Connor, can you please loan me some money? I want to treat grandma's illness. How much do you need? Just let me know. I, I want to borrow 100,000. Ellen took into consideration that she might need more money later, so she decided to ask for more from the beginning. No matter how tiring it would be, she would definitely work hard to pay back this debt. 100,000. That's not a problem. I'll bring the money over to you right away. After a few seconds of hesitation, his conscience prevailed. When she ended the phone call, she heaved a sigh of relief. At this moment, she was delighted to have a rich uncle who could help her during the most difficult time of her life. Just as Connor was leaving the house, Olivia caught sight of him and hurriedly asked, Where are you going? Aunt Jessica fell last night and is being hospitalized right now. Ellen lacks the funds for the medical expenses, so I'm bringing some money over to her. Olivia's expression fell instantly, and she immediately probed further. How much do you plan to give her? 100,000. What? She asked you for 100,000. No way. The most you can loan her is 20,000. And you must insist that she pays you back, she declared forcefully. How? How can you be so heartless? She is my Aunt Jessica. You have to know that an elderly person like Aunt Jessica will need a lot more money down the road for her medical expenses after suffering from a serious fall. Besides, she won't be saved even if we spent all that money on her. Why waste our money on something so useless? After saying that, she continued, if you help Ellen on this occasion, 
But Aunt Jessica unfortunately passes, she will definitely approach us for money again. He was forced to compromise with her. All right, I'll only lend her 50,000 then. It's not easy for a child like her. After saying that, he opened the door to leave. However, Olivia's anger was not assuaged. She stood there scolding him angrily. Where are you getting that money from? Our money is for retirement. How can you spend that money so carelessly? Mom, what are you yelling about? Selena came downstairs with a huge yawn. Your father's aunt, Aunt Jessica, fell last night and was hospitalized. Ellen asked us for money early this morning, and your father agreed to loan her 100,000. Of course, I have to say no. What? Borrow 100,000. When will she be able to pay us back? She only earns a meager salary of 3,000 a month. Selena couldn't help feeling distressed over her family's finances. That's what I was saying. Even if she did her best to starve herself, it would take more than three years for her to pay us back. Olivia snorted disdainfully. Selena felt that it was unlucky to learn about something like this so early in the morning. Mom, I'm going shopping later. You mentioned that you'd give me 500,000 last time. Can you transfer that amount to my card now? Sure, I'll do it in a bit. Olivia's expression immediately became gentle. She would never skimp on her daughter's expenses. That was because she had believed in a certain principle since she was young. A daughter should be raised in luxury to raise her horizons and connections to marry a rich man. In the future, in the hospital, Jessica had woken up by the time Connor arrived at the hospital. She could sense that she no longer had much time left to live. Therefore, she encouraged Ellen to remain strong and waited for Connor to arrive. Connor handed the money over and sat down beside her bed. She spoke to him with tears in her eyes. Connor, I won't be alive for much longer. The one thing that worries me the most is Ellie. When I'm no longer around, please take her in. Seeing that his relative was about to pass away, he naturally felt very distressed. Not to mention, he had always been a kind-hearted man. All right, Aunt Jessica, I promise you, I will bring Ellie home with me. Good, Ellie is your sister's only child. As her younger brother, you have to help care for her child, she said. After all, that was how your sister took care of you when she was still alive. He nodded hard at those words. At this moment, everything his wife exhorted earlier had been forgotten. He felt like he had just woken up from a dream. This child was his sister's daughter, and he could not bring himself to abandon her without a care. Ellie is a good girl. Find a good husband for her when the time comes. Don't let others bully her. Jessica was not afraid of death. The only thing she feared was that Ellen would be all alone in the world with nobody to take care of her. His promise made her feel relieved and reassured. With that, Jessica calmly accepted her fate. Chapter 1792 The Housekeeper's Room When Ellen walked in through the door, her eyes were swollen from crying. She knew that her grandmother would pass away soon, and the pain in her heart was so intense that she nearly passed out from the distress. Jessica had refused any form of treatment because she wanted to leave all her money to Ellen. For that reason, she passed away peacefully during the early hours of that very day. As Jessica's elder sister, Lilac came over with her son to help with the funeral procedures. Connor hung around too. On the other hand, Ellen was too young and could not understand anything. Nevertheless, her tears did not stop flowing down her face. She could not accept the reality before her. Grandma, Grandma, when Jessica was carried into the hearse, she wept sadly as she kneeled on the ground. Her sorrow was immense. Connor brought Ellen to the crematorium in his car. It didn't take long before the urn containing Jessica's ashes was placed in front of Ellen. She hugged the urn to her chest, and Connor bought a burial plot for Jessica on her behalf. The urn was buried three days later. Jessica had asked Connor to bring Ellen home with him, worried that Ellen would be depressed and scared to be all alone at such a young age. After all, there was nobody to take care of Ellen once she was gone. Therefore, Connor brought Ellen home to retrieve her clothes before taking her back to his house. While he was Driving on the road, he worried about his wife's opinion regarding this sudden turn of events. 
15 celebs whose careers were thwarted after one simple mistake. A mysterious Roman statue discovered in Spain. He quickly took the opportunity to contact Olivia when he stopped to buy a pack of cigarettes. What? She's going to stay at our house for a few days. No way. Olivia, Aunt Jessica just passed away. Ellie is just a child. She is scared and all alone. I promise that I will do. Whatever you want next time. Please just let Ellie stay for a few days. When Olivia heard his promise, she grudgingly agreed. Fine, but only three days. Connor stopped for dinner with Ellen along the way. By the time they arrived home, it was already 10 p.m. Olivia had been waiting by the door and remained courteous to Ellen for Connor's sake. Hey, you're here, Ellie, come inside quickly, she greeted them warmly. Ellen's eyes were red and swollen from crying. Nevertheless, she greeted Olivia politely. Aunt Olivia. All right, it's very late. I've prepared a room for you. Come with me. After saying that, Olivia led Ellen to the housekeeper's room. Connor couldn't help glancing sideways at Olivia when he saw the room. So that's why Olivia sent the housekeeper away. She wanted to vacate the housekeeper's small room for Ellen. It had to be said that their house was a two-story duplex. Aside from the master bedroom, there were six other guest rooms available. However, Olivia was not willing to let Ellen stay in any of the guest rooms. Be that as it may, Ellen was highly grateful for the treatment she received. In fact, she couldn't help feeling uncomfortable and awkward just standing in the bright and luxurious hall in her casual clothes at this moment. There's plenty of entertainment to keep you occupied this fall. All Friends Thanksgiving episodes ranked, you can thank us later. Thank you, Aunt Olivia, she said gratefully. No need for such reservations. It's late. There's a bathroom inside the room. You should go straight to bed after a shower, Olivia suggested warmly. Okay, Ellen nodded obediently. For her, this small room was already more luxurious than any other room she had ever been to before. As soon as Olivia closed the door, Connor grabbed her by the arm and dragged her into the other smaller living room. Then, he angrily questioned her, there are so many guest rooms in the house. Why must you let Ellie stay in the housekeeper's room? You're asking me why? Didn't you see how dirty her clothes were? Besides, I never agreed to bring her home in the first place. You're the one who stubbornly insisted on bringing her home. Olivia snapped furiously. She seemed even more upset than him. At this moment, Connor had no intention of arguing with her. He was worried that Ellen would no longer want to live in this house if she overheard their argument. Where is Lena? He asked. Lena is out with her friends. Ask her to come home immediately. How can a girl stay out so late? That's highly improper. He directed all his resentment and frustrations upon the fact that his daughter was staying out late. Her expression immediately darkened at those words. What did you mean by that, Connor Aguirre? What's wrong with our daughter having fun with her own circle of friends? However, he could not be bothered to argue with her. The last two days had exhausted him. On the other hand, Ellen gingerly sat on the bed inside the small room. She could tell this room belonged to the housekeeper, but she was not bothered by it. Not long afterward, Selena returned home. She was changing her shoes at the doorway when Olivia came and whispered something in her ear. Ellen has come to live in our home. What? Ellen. She wondered whether she had misheard her mother. Although she knew that her great aunt, Jessica had passed away, was Ellen really going to stay at their home from now on? Chapter 1793 Leading a Servant's Life how long will she be staying? Selena expressed her dissatisfaction on her face. I don't like having strangers in the house. Of course, I won't let her stay here for a long time. I plan to kick her out after three days. After saying that, Olivia made a shushing sound. Don't be so loud. Why don't you return to your room? I've placed her in the housekeeper's room, and your father is unhappy about that. After hearing those words, Selena became even more upset. She was jealous that her father was being so lovely to Ellen. The last two days had been extremely exhausting, so Ellen fell asleep as soon as she lay down on the bed. She 
dreamt of her grandmother that night, causing tears to flow down her face again. The next morning, a knock sounded on Ellen's door. She immediately got out of bed and changed her clothes. When she opened the door, she saw Olivia standing outside. Good morning, Aunt Olivia. Ellie, do you know how to make breakfast? Our housekeeper is on leave, so there's nobody in the house to make. Breakfast for us. Yes, I can make breakfast. I know how to make spaghetti. Good. Follow me to the kitchen. Olivia guided Ellen to the kitchen and took out some pasta, vegetables, and eggs. So that Ellen could make breakfast for the entire family. By the time Connor and Selena woke up, there was already a large bowl of spaghetti on the table. Moreover, Ellen had prepared several beautiful poached eggs to go with the meal. Olivia looked at the sight and sneered silently. So, it's true that children from poorer families learn to take care of their families from a young age. Although her daughter did not know how to cook or make any kind of breakfast, she firmly believed that her daughter would marry into a family that would not require her to cook. This way, her daughter's hands wouldn't be dry or cracked. She grudgingly praised Ellen in front of her husband. Connor, look, Ellie woke up early in the morning just to prepare breakfast for us. It looks absolutely delicious. Connor exclaimed in surprise, Ellie, why did you wake up so early to prepare breakfast? I, I woke up early, so I decided to make breakfast. Ellen did not dare to tell him that Olivia had woken her up to cook breakfast. Olivia immediately beckoned Ellen. Come, Ellie, let's sit down and have breakfast together. Seeing that Selena had not greeted Ellen, Connor turned toward her and scolded, Lena, why didn't you greet? Ellie, good morning, Ellen, Selena greeted in a perfunctory manner. Good morning, Selena, Ellen greeted in return. During breakfast, Selena began to tell her mother about her plans for the day. In the morning, she planned to head to the spa for a massage. Then, she was going shopping with her friends in the afternoon followed by a gathering with her classmates at night. Just listening to her schedule for the day was enough to make anybody envious. Connor listened to his daughter's schedule and suddenly blurted out, Lena, why don't you bring Ellie with you? You can show her around. Selena froze in the middle of eating her noodles, Dad, Ellie is not acquainted with my friends. How can she hang out with us? That's right. Lena and her friends are students who came back from studying abroad. She won't fit in. Despite expressing her discontent, Olivia did not forget to boast about her daughter's superiority at the same time. Ellen blushed furiously and told Connor, Uncle Connor, I'll just rest at home today. After pondering for a moment, Connor did not force the matter. All right then, have a good rest at home today, and... We'll visit the cemetery together tomorrow. He had an appointment with a friend after breakfast. Since he was also going out, only Olivia and Ellen would remain at home. The truth was that Olivia originally had an appointment. It was just that she felt uneasy about leaving Ellen at home. Alone. What if she lost something important? It had to be said that both she and her daughter's jewelry were very expensive. That was why she decided to stay at home and watch Ellen. Ellie, I hurt my wrist recently and can't do the laundry. Can you help us with the laundry? Okay, Aunt Olivia. Ellie, the floor looks a little dirty. The mop is in the storeroom. Can you mop the floor, please? Don't forget to mop the staircase while you're at it. It's getting dusty. Ellen was treated like a servant and ordered around by Olivia to do various chores. Olivia also instructed Ellen to cook lunch at noon. After Olivia finished her lunch, she relaxed in front of the television as though she were a queen. As for Ellen, after she finished doing those chores, she was so tired that she fell asleep in the afternoon. It was at this moment that she received a phone call from her colleague. Their boss was laying off some employees since business at the cafe was not doing too well. As she happened to be on leave for the week, he decided to terminate her employment immediately. Chapter 1794 Guilt and Presents Ellen's tears welled up in her eyes again in her disappointment, and the tough demeanor she maintained fell apart. In an instant, no matter how unfairly life treated her, she could always face it with a smile. Nevertheless, she felt absolutely powerless and weak at this moment. 
That evening, Connor offered to take Ellen and Olivia out for dinner after he came back from his appointment. They went to an upscale steakhouse near their residence. Having lived in the area for more than 10 years, they had gotten into the habit of eating at such places. Olivia couldn't resist using this opportunity to show off. Ellie, here, try this. I'm sure you've never tasted these before. Olivia handed Ellen a plate of desserts. Ellen quickly thanked her aunt. Thank you, Aunt Olivia. It's nothing. We often eat these, so we've gotten tired of eating them, Olivia added. Connor immediately glanced sideways at her, warning her not to boast to Ellen. After all, it was all thanks to Ellen's brother that they could enjoy their current lifestyle. He could not bear to watch how she enjoyed the blessings that Ellen's brother gave them while expressing disparaging remarks about Ellen. Olivia looked away, upset at being rebuked. As Ellen was a sensitive person by nature, she immediately lowered her head and ate quietly without saying anything else. After dinner, Connor brought Ellen to the nearby shopping mall and bought some clothes for her. Although Ellen kept refusing his goodwill, he stubbornly insisted on buying the clothes for her. His little shopping spree immediately racked up a bill of more than a thousand dollars. Olivia fumed at the sight and thought to herself, in order to prevent Connor from buying clothes for her again, I'm going to give my daughter's old clothes to her tonight. By the time they reached home, it was already 9.30 p.m. Ellen stayed inside the housekeeper's room and did not come out again. On the other hand, Olivia rummaged through the wardrobe on the second floor and packed up all the old clothes that Selena no longer wore. Connor walked into the wardrobe and asked, what are you doing? Packing up Lena's old clothes for Ellen. We can just buy new clothes for her. Why are you giving her old clothes? Lena no longer likes wearing these clothes, but they aren't old. If you sold any of them, these used items would still fetch a price of several hundred. She responded indignantly. Nevertheless, he did not feel comfortable with her actions and asked her to stop. Stop it. No matter how good the condition of the clothes may be, they are still clothes that Lena has worn. I'm sure Ellie will feel unhappy about getting these old clothes. Why would she be unhappy? These clothes are better than the rags she's wearing at the moment. I don't know if it's because her clothes were shedding, but I found a lot of lint on my clothes when I was putting the laundry away. Today, she immediately complained. He snapped at her in frustration. That child is so pitiful. Can't you just bear with her for the time being? Connor, I'm being serious with you. You'd better not let Ellen stay here for too long. Don't you dare blame me if I accidentally tell her about how her brother donated his heart. I'm a talkative person by nature after all. It's not like you don't know that. How could you say that? He couldn't help panicking slightly. She snorted and sneered. We could just tell her the truth. The money is in our hands anyway. What is there to be afraid of? Do you think a little girl like her can do anything to us? You must never tell anybody about this matter, or we will drown in the criticisms of the public. Fine, I'll keep my mouth shut. In return, you'd better make the girl leave as soon as possible. Just looking at her makes me uneasy. It feels like she is going to steal everything away from us at any time. After warning her, husband, she continued to pack up the clothes. It didn't take long for her to go downstairs with a big bag of clothes in her hand. She carried the bag to Ellen's room and said, Ellie, I'm sorry for troubling you. These are Selena's old clothes. She's too picky and refuses to wear them again after a few times. These clothes are all in good condition, so I'm giving them to you. I hope you don't mind. Ellen was stunned. She never imagined that her aunt would give her so many clothes. Regardless of the reason, she felt grateful for the kind gesture. Thank you, Aunt Olivia. These clothes are of great quality. That's what I think too. Lena loves buying clothes. In fact, she spends so much money without even batting an eyelid. Look at these clothes, each piece costs at least several hundred. Olivia even boasted. Thank you, Aunt Olivia. Ellen expressed her gratitude once more before Olivia finally left. Chapter 1795 The Funeral Ellen certainly did not turn her nose up at the clothes. Now that she had lost her job, she would need to live frugally. 
and save as much money as she could. She had used up all her money to pay for the medical expenses, and Connor was the one who paid for the remainder. All she had on hand was her salary of 450. She had just received it. It was nearly 1 a.m. Ellen was sleeping when she was awoken by the noises coming from outside her room. She got off the bed and cracked open the door to peep outside. Mom, when is she leaving? I don't even feel like coming home anymore. Selena's voice came from the living room. Be quiet. Don't let her hear you. Who cares if she hears me? I'll ask her to leave tomorrow. I've already discussed this matter with your father. We'll never take her in. Ellen's face flushed deep red with humiliation. It turns out that I'm unwelcomed here. Early in the morning of the third day, Connor and his family headed to the cemetery with Ellen. The funeral was handled by Lilac and her family, so Ellen would only need to attend the funeral as part of the family. Looking down at the urn that was being buried in the ground, Ellen felt her tears flowing down her cheeks. The person she loved the most had left her. Selena had always been a cold-hearted person ever since she was a child. Despite seeing how hard Ellen was weeping, she felt nothing. In fact, she thought that the entire funeral was a complete waste of her time. At this moment, Connor's eyes were reddened. Recalling how his aunt had helped him in the past, he couldn't help. Feeling sad about her death. On the other hand, Olivia had gone out of her way to dress up for this event. Although she was dressed in black, she was decked in jewelry. Moreover, the jewelry that adorned her was very fancy. Finally, Jessica was buried peacefully. From now onward, Ellen was all alone with nobody to lean on in this world. Lilac walked over and said, Connor, what are your plans for Ellie? You can't expect her to be on her own. She's just a child. What child? She's already 22 years old, Olivia immediately retorted. How dare you try to put the responsibility of taking care of Ellen on us? I won't let you succeed. Unable to persuade Olivia, Lilac could only sigh heavily. Connor replied, Aunt Lilac, I'll definitely help Ellie. Olivia sneered coldly at those words. I won't allow him to do that. Not only is Selena uncomfortable with Ellen's presence, but it is so inconvenient to have Ellen in the house. I used to be able to do whatever I wanted in the past. But I have to accommodate her in everything I do now. Ellen heard the conversation from nearby and walked over. Uncle Connor, I'll move back home tonight. I won't disturb you any longer. Ellie, why are you moving back so suddenly? We have room for you. Connor couldn't help asking. I want to keep vigil for Grandma. I'm not scared. Grandma was everything to me, she responded bravely. She did not want to return to her uncle's house and continue being a burden to them. You're right, Ellie. One must always repay the kindness one has received. Let's heed her wishes and allow her to go home to keep vigil. Olivia immediately agreed. She did not know why she was feeling a sense of guilt and fear. At this moment, she also couldn't help feeling as though there was a chilly presence behind her whenever she looked at Jessica's grave. Connor was forced to agree with the arrangement. After the funeral, he sent Ellen back to her home. Looking at the dilapidated village that she was living in, he took out the card that he used last time and said, there is 15,000 in this card. Take it. I can't, Uncle Connor. That's your money. I can't take that. Just take it. No, Uncle Connor. If Aunt Olivia learns about this, she'll be very upset. Ellen was a sensible child. When Connor drove away from Ellen's house, his phone rang. He glanced at the caller ID and immediately stopped. His car by the side of the road. Then, he solemnly answered the phone call. Hello, President Curtis. Mr. Aguirre, I believe you previously mentioned that your daughter would like to work at Presgrave Group. I've already made the necessary arrangements. According to her education and experience, we've temporarily placed her in the position of a financial analyst. Are you satisfied with that arrangement? Thank you. I'm very satisfied with the arrangement, President Curtis. However, I would like to make another request if possible. I have a niece who is very pretty and has just graduated from university recently. Can I trouble you to arrange a position for her as well? He swallowed his pride and asked. 
Chapter 1796 You're hired. However, the person on the other end remained friendly as he said, how about this? I'll get her a job at the reception first. If she's willing to take this job, we'll give her an official contract once the probation period of three months is over. Please send me her number and basic details. Okay, great. Thank you a bunch, Mr. McConaughey, Connor said in relief, thinking that this was suitable. Compensation for Ellen. His daughter was employed, and Ellen didn't have to worry about job searching anymore. When he got home, Olivia continued to ask him whether he had given any money to Ellen, which was within his expectations. She wouldn't take it even if I wanted to give it to her, he answered helplessly. It's only right that she doesn't take it as she should understand that every single penny from this family is unrelated to her, Olivia scoffed. Every word she uttered was more demeaning than the last. He stared at his wife and felt as though he was looking at a stranger. What turned her into such a heartless person? Was it money? He wondered. All these years, their relationship was quite stable, but he noticed that his wife had gradually turned into a selfish and indifferent person. She hoarded money like a dragon and no longer had any compassion for others. Annoyed by his stare, she barked, What are you looking at? Nothing. Initially, he wanted to tell her that he had gotten Ellen into the Presgrave group as well, but he decided against it. Soon, Selena returned home and was over the moon to find out that she got the position of financial analyst. For a fresh graduate, it would be impossible for her to get such a good job. Furthermore, she merely wanted to go there and work to get an extra point for herself so that she could have better chances of meeting men of higher social class. While she sat on the couch, the image of that young man she bumped into at the golf course that day appeared in her mind. For the past few days, she would go there for a walk and take some pictures with her friends, but she didn't run into him again. Despite her disappointment, she looked forward to seeing him again because some people in this world had the charm to steal one's heart at first sight. At night, Ellen fell asleep amidst her tears, she wasn't afraid, but she merely missed Jessica and couldn't accept the fact that she was gone. Early the following day, she woke up in a daze when she heard her cell phone ringing. She blindly reached out to grab her phone and picked up the call. Hello, who's this? Am I speaking to Miss Ellen Reese? I'm calling from the Human Resource Department of Presgrave Group. Can you come to work tomorrow? Work. Presgrave Group. Me. A clueless Ellen didn't remember submitting her resume to this company before. Yes, you're hired. Is there a problem? At the moment, she was in urgent need of a job. She couldn't be bothered to wonder whether this job offer was a mistake as she grasped it tight like a lifeline. No, no problem at all. I'll be there tomorrow, she stammered with excitement. Even after she had ended the call, she still thought she was dreaming. She had a job now, and it was even a job at Presgrave Group. Once again, she tried to recall the resumes she had sent and was sure that she hadn't sent one. There, whatever, she thought. I'll just show up there tomorrow and see what happens. Out of the blue, she was struck with overwhelming sorrow. If Jessica was watching her from the other side and knew that she was going to start working in a huge corporation, would she be happy for her? She would need a decent business suit for her job tomorrow. Alas, the clothes Connor bought for her were all casual wear, which was unsuitable for an interview. In addition, an international company such as Presgrave Group would definitely have a strict dress code. Hence, she opened the other bags that were fully packed. These were the old clothing that Olivia had packed for her, and she had brought all of them back. One by one, she laid them out on the bed to take a good look at them. Finally, she found a business suit with a skirt that looked professional, and she heaved a sigh of relief. Not only did this look good, but it also didn't look worn out. After she checked the label and noticed that it was from a renowned brand, she sighed again. Selena's life is something that I couldn't even have in my dreams. Chapter 1797 Day 1 at Work Of course, she wasn't jealous but merely envious because she had faith that her life would only improve. The next day before going to work, she wore some light makeup early in the morning and took the public bus to Presgrave Group. 
Meanwhile, at Connor's house, Selena had put on the business suit she had just bought and wore delicate makeup. Before leaving the house via her father's luxury car. Under the morning sun, the dark blue glass panels of the Presgrave Group building walls reflected a dazzling light. And after Ellen hopped off the public bus, she scurried over quickly, worried that she would be late. At the same time, Selena had just arrived after parking the car in the parking lot. She held her purse over her shoulder, paced toward the revolving doors, and it was then that she caught sight of a familiar figure. She thought that her eyes were playing tricks on her, so she focused and looked again. I was right, she thought. I did see Ellen. How's this possible? Why is she here? Also, the attire she's wearing looks very familiar as well. That looks like it belonged to me. Mom told me that she gave Ellen all of my old clothes, and it seemed like she was really wearing them. Her red lips turned upward into a contemptuous smirk, and she walked briskly toward the lobby. Ellen stood in the lobby and raised her head in amazement as she stared in awe at the grand and resplendent hall. Too stunned by the sight. This was a working environment she had never imagined working in, and it was simply too grand. Right then, Selena walked in and saw her. Although she really didn't want to acknowledge her, curiosity got the better of her, and she approached her, asking, Ellen, what are you doing here? A startled Ellen turned and lit up when she saw Selena. You're here, too, Selena. Are you here to work as well? It's my first day at work today. So, what are you doing here? She's not here to do odd jobs, is she? Selena. Wondered. Ellen blinked innocently as she answered, I am here to work. What? Selena thought that she had misheard Ellen, yet her hopes were shattered when she saw Ellen's nod. It's my first day at work, too. Selena took a deep breath as she thought, how could she get a job here? What qualifications does she have? These clothes are mine, aren't they? Are you sure you can bring out the elegance of these clothes? She scoffed. And flounced off in annoyance. The fact that Ellen was working here made her feel that the compelling character of the place had lowered. Meanwhile, Ellen's face was scarlet for a second and pale the next. Although she knew that Selena was mocking her, she could only sigh and let it go. Then, she went to the Human Resource Department to sign the employment contract. She still couldn't believe she was hired and even immediately had a position at the front desk. When she saw the base salary, her eyes lit up with delight. My God, the base salary is 15000 She gushed silently, and her hands shook with excitement as she signed the contract. After she read through the contract, she was sent to look for her superior at the front desk to assign work to her. Back in the lobby, Ellen looked at the long and grand front desk, all of the equipment was so advanced. She couldn't help but feel that this entire place looked elegant despite it being just a receptionist's working area. She was assigned next to senior staff because her superior, Carrie Lynch, took extra care of her and didn't give her any pressure at all. In addition, Carrie had also received a note from the higher-ups, so she treated Ellen slightly better than the others. Simultaneously in the finance department, Selena was assigned an office to herself within an extensive department. Although her run-in with Ellen had dampened her mood, she was still pleased with her job. Selena was a person who was good at handling situations and even better at acting coy. So, it wasn't long before. She got a male colleague in the office beside hers to teach her devotedly and would always show up to help on. Matters that stumped her. Ellen clocked off at 6.30 p.m. on her first day of work. Although she messed up sometimes due to her inexperience. She was a quick learner. It also helped that there happened to be another colleague at the front desk who was. About to get married soon. So, her colleague guided her to take over the workload. After work, Ellen went home immediately while Selena went out with that male colleague for dinner to learn about the ins and outs of the company. Chapter 1798 That's him, my boss. Selena could no longer suppress her curiosity any longer as she asked, Chris, who's the president of Presgrave? Group now, don't you know that the young master of the Presgrave family has taken over the reins at the company? What does he look like? I've never seen him before. Do you have a picture of him? She asked inquisitively. 
The next second, a man named Christian took out his phone and scrolled through to find the picture that was circulated in the company's internal group. The man in the photo was seated in the conference room, looking young and dashing with an intelligent glint in his eyes, simply a hunk that was a 10 on the scale. Selena took his phone, glanced at the picture, and almost dropped it. Nevertheless, she hurriedly composed herself. As she held it tightly and covered her mouth, staring in disbelief at the man in the photo. Oh, my God, isn't this the man I bumped into at the golf course last time? So, he's the current boss of Presgrave. Group. Her heart beat madly against her chest, and her eyes were filled with ambition as she smiled happily at the picture. So, this is our boss. Will we meet him every day? Her words sent a pang of jealousy through Christian's chest. Truth be told, he was a little interested in Selena. Because she was a newbie at the company, pretty, and had a good figure. In addition, he could tell from how she looked that she came from a wealthy family because he accidentally glanced at her car key and saw that she was driving a Bentley, of course, he was interested in her. Regular employees like us don't have a chance to meet him, he said, shaking his head. However, in Selena's heart, she was already fantasizing about how she could get to know her boss. The last thing she was expecting was for the man she thought she would never meet again would appear so suddenly, and she was so excited that she wanted to scream her joy at the rooftops. After dinner, she went home and found Olivia in high spirits over the fact that she had a proper job. How did it go? Are you happy on your first day? Yes, but an annoying person affected my mood, she answered candidly. What annoying person? Olivia asked quizzically. Who else but Ellen? I don't even know how she managed a job at Presgrave Group. What a damper. She whined. Utterly annoyed. When Olivia heard that, she immediately caught on to the situation, when she asked Connor to introduce a job to their daughter, he also roped Ellen into the company. This made her incredibly displeased because she didn't think. It was a good thing that he was so concerned about Ellen out of the blue. The thing that scared her the most was Ellen finding out one day that they had donated her brother's heart. Not only that, they didn't even share a single penny out of that huge amount with her. If she really lost her mind, she might actually ruin their family. When Selena returned to her room to rest, Olivia called Connor into the room for questioning right after he returned home. Yes, I did get Ellen into the company. What's the problem? Isn't this just a small gesture? He said, annoyed by the interrogations. Olivia sulked. Looks like your pitiful niece is the only one in your eyes now, huh? Do you want to ruin our family? As he didn't want to bring up this matter, he went into the bedroom and straight to bed. On the other hand, the more Olivia thought about it, the angrier she became. It was a glorious thing that her daughter was working in. Presgrave group, but it irked her that Ellen also had a share in this glory. Later, she knocked on Selena's door to have a chat with her. Mom, do you know? I found out something that made me really happy today, Selena said, recalling that she had yet to tell her mother about this. What is it? Turns out that the dreamboat I met at the golf course the other day is my boss. What? Is he young? How old is he? Olivia asked, her heart skipping with a thud. He's very young. About 25. What's his family name? Of course, it's Presgrave. Selena blinked at her mother and cast her a puzzled look. However, the look on Olivia's face was definitely something. It was evident that she was excited but also nervous as. She thought, who would have thought that the boy who had the heart transplant is now the heir of the Presgrave. Family in a blink of an eye. How time flies. And we've been under the care of the Presgrave family for 16 years now. Chapter 1799 Don't let Ellen know. But I'm just a small employee. How I wish to know him. I should at least let him notice me. Selena whined with a look of disappointment while holding her mother's hands. Suddenly, a brazen idea popped into Olivia's mind, probably her most daring thought ever. That was to find a way to get her daughter acquainted with the young master of the Presgrave family and let her marry him. That way, they would live a life of luxury for the rest of their lives. Have some patience, Lena. Maybe you'll have the chance to get to know him in the future. Let's take our time. 
How will I have the chance to meet him, mom? She grumbled, still wearing an expression of self-pity. Olivia gazed at her daughter's beautiful face, which she had spent a lot of money on. Selena had recovered well from the surgery and now had a face that looked naturally beautiful, so she believed that her daughter could marry into a wealthy family with that face. Moreover, the Presgrave family owed them for saving a life, namely their young master. The only reason he was able to live was that they signed the papers back then. They could be considered his savior, and one day when they meet this young master, they just needed to bring this up to him to be acquainted. Nevertheless, this had to be kept from one person, Ellen. This young master should never find out that the one who donated his heart still had a sister living in this world. Otherwise, he would be grateful to Ellen instead of them, and the more Olivia thought about it, the angrier she felt. So, why did Connor rope Ellen into the Presgrave group? He's just ruining Lena's future. In the meantime, Jared was having dinner in a high-end restaurant with two senior management staff on his side. One of them was Hubert McConaughey, and he mentioned casually, Mr. Presgrave, do you still remember the relatives of that boy from back then? I just assigned two girls from his family to work in our company yesterday. Jared nodded in reply. Of course, I remember them. I wouldn't be here today if they hadn't signed the papers back. Then. That's true. Back then, Mr. Elliot had given his instructions, and I've been in contact with them and paying attention to them all these years because I know that the Pressgraves owe a great debt to them. Thank you, Mr. Hubert. This is nothing. Seeing that you're so healthy now, I think nothing of this little contribution of mine. What position did you assign them? Did you pass a message to the other staff? Jared asked. One at the reception and another in the finance department. Okay, take care of them. Then, he asked, are the documents for the demolition and resettlement approved? Yes, it's done. Maybe the official document will be out in a couple of days. Jared nodded. Okay. Due to national policies, the Pressgraves were obligated to help with the city's development because of their status. As the leading corporation, hence, they had contracted a piece of land for demolition and resettlement. In the evening, Ellen had just had dinner outside before she ran into her neighbor, who told her the news in excitement. Ellie, do you know that our land will be demolished? This day has finally arrived. When is this happening? Ellen asked in surprise. Soon. I heard that the official documents will be out soon. Ellen felt bittersweet. How amazing it would be if Jessica were still alive when this happened. Then, she could enjoy the benefits of the resettlement together with her. Ellie, you'll get a share of the compensation money at that time. Enjoy your days. Your grandmother will keep a watch over you from the other side. Okay. Ellen nodded, but it suddenly hit her that Jessica's demise was unexpected, she did not change the titles. Naaman was adopted, so she had no clue whether she could get a share. But now, she already had a job that could pay her bills, and she wasn't that keen to make a windfall on the side. At the same time, Connor received this news even earlier than her because a friend of his in the government department immediately called him. Connor, that land where your aunt's house is located is about to be demolished. Really? Are you sure? The news I received is concrete, but isn't your aunt no longer around? Chapter 1800 Let's Share the Money she still has another granddaughter. That's good. She'll be compensated quite well. That land is very pricey now. And not any company could demolish it. I heard it's the Presgrave group who took up the project. Really? They're just taking this to help the development of the city. That little piece of land can't catch their eyes. You're right. Maybe they're just doing a kind deed. Olivia was standing behind him and overheard his conversation. After he hung up the call, she leaned in and asked, is Aunt Jessica's house going to be demolished? Yeah, I just received a call saying that it will be demolished, and the papers will be out soon. Wow, if that place is going to be demolished, your aunt's little three-story house will receive a huge compensation. Suddenly, Olivia was filled with jealousy and wished that all three stories of the house belonged to her. I don't know yet. Let's see. Then, that money will end up in Ellie's hands, huh? She asked and added, hey, that's not right. 
Legally, she's not. Aunt Jessica's legal descendant. They've always maintained a foster relationship, and Ellie is never under her family. Registry. I hope this money ends up with Ellie. That way, she won't have to be in such hardship, and we can set our conscience at ease, Connor said. Indifference flashed past her eyes. Your wish might not come true. In addition, looking at the current situation, Aunt Jessica doesn't have any children living in that house, and her younger generations could get a share of this. Demolition compensation. I bet you can get it as well. Maybe we can get a small share of it. A stunned Connor jerked his head to look at her and said, Will you please stop snatching what belongs to Ellie? What do you mean by that? Aren't we doing it together? Olivia snorted. You make it sound like it's all my fault. I'm telling you, we will get a share once this demolition fee is passed down. After she said that, she pushed the door open and went out to call Garrett, the eldest son of Jessica's family. She immediately told him about the demolition, which got him very excited. Olivia, is that true? Of course, it's true. All of us will get a share. Maybe your mother will get a larger amount. After she gets her share, it will come to the next generation to divide the money. All three of you will get a potion. In the end, Ellen will get one portion. That means that demolition compensation can be divided into six parts. I'm in need of money now. So, Olivia, let's agree that all of us will get a share when the time comes. That goes without saying. Only when she was done could she finally go to sleep soundly. For some inexplicable reasons, she just couldn't stand to see Ellen doing well. It was as though this child was meant to bring her ill luck. Since birth. On the other side, Garrett quickly shared this news with his younger brother and sister. Everyone was overjoyed. Upon hearing that they would get some money. After all, besides Olivia's family being wealthy, the rest of them were struggling in the lower class. How could they let go of a chance where they could get some money? Surely, they would grab this money at the first chance they got. Furthermore, they didn't have any relation to Ellen, plus the fact that she was a young girl, they thought it was fine. As long as she could get some money, Ellen went to work in the morning. As the company had given her four sets of uniforms, she had donned the uniform to work today, and her entire temperament had changed, appearing fresh and clean. On the streets, even, a few people would turn back to take a second look at her. After she arrived early to work, she started to help clear the desk. Sienna, the person showing her around work, today, had even specially bought her breakfast. Thank you, Sienna. You're welcome. Perhaps it was due to the fact that Sienna was about to get married, as she was practically brimming with a gentle charm. Then, the high-level executives started showing up for work, and Ellen was struck with envy at their tailored and smart suits. I heard that the people working here are paid handsomely, she thought. Not long afterward, she saw a person, Selena, who also saw her. They stared at each other for a split second. Before Selena walked into the lift expressionlessly. Chapter 1801 Are you working here as well? Ellen knew that Selena was pretending not to know her because she didn't deserve to work here, and she understood Selena and her arrogance. Since that was the case, she would just pretend not to know her as well. Under Sienna's careful guidance, she roughly grasped the work that had to be done. Around 10.30 a.m., Sienna picked up a document and said, Someone passed this here. Please pass it on to Mr. Jonas's assistant on the 12th floor. Ellen gave her a nod. Okay. 12th floor, Mr. Jonas's assistant, she repeatedly chanted in her head to remember. The details, held the document to her chest, and briskly walked toward the elevators. As she had been learning a lot this morning, her mind was a little fuzzy right now. While she was thinking about something, she saw that the doors of an elevator were about to close and dashed in quickly. All of a sudden, she knocked into a man in the lift. The documents in her arms fell to the floor with a flap and scattered everywhere. What? She was taken aback by her clumsiness and immediately apologized to the man as she bent down to pick up the document papers because they were simply too important to her. At the same time, the man next to her crouched down and helped her to pick up the papers with his slender fingers. 
When she noticed the white silk, blue sapphire cufflinks, and an expensive black watch, she felt something amiss. And lifted her head abruptly, and the sight that awaited her stunned her. Goodness, it's him, isn't he that young man who helped me at the golf course the last time? Jared recognized her as well, and his brilliant eyes narrowed. It's you. You're, working here as well. Happiness washed over her. She didn't expect to run into someone she had met. Before, so she was especially friendly to him. At first, he was stunned by the turn of events, but a grin appeared on his face a second later. Yes, I'm working. Here as well. Which level is your office? 18th floor. Even Jared didn't know why he fibbed because the 18th floor was the finance department. My name is Ellen Reese. What's your name? He thought of it for a second before he decided to use his mother's last name. My name is Jared Tillman. Ellen flashed him a brilliant smile. Hi, nice to meet you. He was slightly taken aback by her grin and felt a little sense of familiarity with this girl in his chest. Despite this, being only the second time that they had met, she made his heart beat slightly out of pace like she was someone he had known for a long time. Nice to meet you, he greeted in return. Only then did she remember that she wanted to go to the twelfth floor and hurriedly press the button. She smiled at the hunk next to her awkwardly as her face inexplicably turned crimson. Gosh, this man is gorgeous. He was the most good-looking of all the men she had met since she was young. From him, she could feel a very comfortable and assuring presence that was gentle and strong at the same time. Since he's working here, will I get to see him all the time after this? Jared Tillman, that's a lovely name. Ding. They reached the twelfth floor, and she gave him another smile. I've arrived. See you. Bye. He stuffed one hand into his trousers pocket and nodded at her slightly. Yet, when the elevator doors closed, Ellen's bright smile still remained in his mind. He could feel his heart was still racing, so he reached out and pressed his chest gently with his palm. Only then did. His heartbeat gradually returned to normal. What's happening? He asked himself in bewilderment. After Ellen dropped off the document and wanted to press the elevator button again, she pressed the button for the elevator that she had arrived in. A kind-hearted staff reminded her politely, Miss, you can't use that elevator. Why? Don't you know that that's our president's private elevator? It's not for other employees to use. Oh, really? She was surprised as she thought, but I just used it earlier and ran into another guy inside. Thank you, she said to the female employee and didn't dare to push the button again. At the finance department, Selena had a few male colleagues around her, taking turns to guide her. She was doing exceedingly well, especially with her pretty face. As long as she flirted a little, a guy would help her finish her job. Then, she heard that an assistant had a document that needed to be sent to the president's office and immediately scurried over to intercept the task, Laura, let me run this errand for you. I can use this chance to familiarize myself with the company. Chapter 1802 I'll drop you home. Laura was more than delighted. Sure, go ahead. Selena left the department with the document in her hands, and the only thought on her mind was the possibility of meeting the company president later when she went upstairs. She was filled with hope and anticipation as she stepped into the elevator, which shot up to the 58th floor. Directly, her heart galloped madly against her chest, and finally, the elevator stopped with a ding, and she felt that the entire floor was shrouded in a solemn air, as though she shouldn't do as she wished here. A few steps later, a female assistant approached and asked her, Are you here to deliver a document? Yes, I am. Just pass it to me. The assistant took the document from her, and she quickly asked, Miss, do you have a washroom here? I really need to go now. Over there, the lady answered, pointing somewhere. She thanked her and strolled toward the washroom, watching the entire floor intently during her brief tour. After she used the restroom, she pretended to have lost her way and saw a huge, golden door with the word, President's Office, written over it. Her heart skipped a beat almost immediately. Oh, how she wished to meet the president here, even if it was just a glance from a distance. Unfortunately, Lady Luck wasn't on her side. That door didn't even budge even though she waited for more than 
10 minutes, and she could only leave in disappointment because if she hung around any longer, people would be suspicious of her motive. When it was time to clock off, she stole a glance at the reception once again. Ellen was still there, placing her in a really foul mood. Dressed in the dark blue uniform assigned to the reception desk, Ellen had transformed from a poor little girl into an elegant white-collar worker. She was like an ugly duckling who had turned into a white swan. To Selena, this was very frustrating because, in her opinion, Ellen should always live in her shadows and not have the chance to do well in life. Everyone had already left for home. Nevertheless, Ellen decided to stay behind to work overtime. She didn't stay because of the extra hour fees, but she needed the computer in the company to finish her work. Soon, she was the only one left at the reception in the lobby. She was so engrossed in finishing the document that she didn't even notice that her surroundings were as dead as a graveyard. Just then, a graceful and charming figure walked out of the elevator. Tall and well-built, the man recalled something. After he stepped out, turned to look at the reception, and suddenly saw that girl named Ellen. She was the only one still working behind the reception counter. Jared contemplated for a moment before he started walking toward the counter. Meanwhile, Ellen had her head buried in work until she heard the sounds of footsteps approaching her. So, she hastily raised her head to greet them. When she saw someone she knew, she immediately smiled at that gorgeous face. Mr. Tillman, are you just heading home? Why haven't you finished work yet? That's because I was recently employed and still familiarizing myself with the work here. So, I'm returning to work. A little more, she said with a smile. Suddenly, Jared remembered that the two girls from the family that Mr. Kane was taking care of, one of them had joined the finance department while the other was working at the reception. Could she be the latter? When did you start working here? She blinked and promptly answered, two days ago. That's probably her, he thought. What a coincidence that she's the relative of that boy that donated his heart. You should head home. It's late. Okay, I was about to leave soon anyway, she said, keeping away her document and looking like she was planning to leave. When Jared checked the time on his watch, he suddenly offered, I'll drop you home. Oh, it's fine. I can't trouble you because my place is quite far away. I'm free. This is nothing, he insisted. She was delighted by his kindness and shyly accepted his offer. Thanks for the trouble, then, she said and quickly grabbed her bag. There was no one else in the lobby, and she followed in the footsteps of the man in front of her all the way until they had descended the steps. After that, she saw a very dashing and eye-catching sports car in front of her, and she couldn't help but gush in awe. This can't be his car, can it? Sure enough, the man pushed the unlock button, and the car beeped twice in response. Finally, he opened the passenger seat door and urged, hop in. Thank you. Ellen was overwhelmed with excitement that she couldn't help herself from doing something silly. She stomped her feet several times to get the dirt off her soles before she dared to cautiously get into his expensive car. Chapter 1803 Demolition Payment It was Ellen's first time in a sports car, hence the nervousness and thrill running down her spine. I didn't know Mr. Tillman is loaded. Is there anyone else in your family? Jared initiated a conversation. No, I'm the only one, she replied naturally. You, alone. He looked at her in surprise. Yup, I'm all alone. My brother is gone a long time ago, and my grandmother passed away two weeks ago. She could not mask the overflowing sorrow. I'm sorry for your loss, he apologized for pricking her sore spot. She shook her head. Thank you. Ellen's address was added to the navigation system. She felt guilty to have him take the long route just to send her home. When they arrived at her place, his brows furrowed. Is this where you live? Yeah, it's my grandmother's place, but it'll be demolished soon. The corner of Jared's lips slightly curved upward. If his memory served him right, that was within the area he planned for demolition. Thanks for the ride. Be careful on your way back. She bent over to bid goodbye. He nodded before driving into a street in the rain. It was not until the sports car vanished from her sight that she finally came back to her senses. 
Red tinges crept onto her cheeks, and there was something familiar about that. Man for some reason, despite his sophisticated grace and the social strata difference between them, she was not afraid of him. Meanwhile, Jared gave his subordinate a call on his way home. After inquiring about the demolition area with the address he had, his conjecture hardened into certainty. Why are you there, Mr. Presgrave? That's the Lockwood Village. My friend needed a ride back home. Your friend lives there. The subordinate doubted that Jared had a friend living in such a place. Meanwhile, at Aguirre residence, Olivia was worried about her daughter, who was in low spirits despite going to work every day. So, she decided to chat with Selena. What's wrong, baby girl? Olivia held a bowl of bird nest soup into the room. Mom, can't you just drive Ellen out of the company? She's such an eyesore. Selena turned her head sideways. Just don't mind her. I remember that time she didn't want to give me her toy when I wanted it during our younger days. I simply borrowed it for a while, yet she accused me of stealing. Dad even told me off because of that. Selena brought up their younger times. Olivia secretly did not favor Ellen as she scoffed. Someone like her is bound to be a non-starter. Her affirmation lifted Selena's spirit. When Selena finished the bird's nest soup, she had a question unanswered. Mom, we won't go bankrupt, will we? Of course not. We need not worry about money. Olivia reassured her confidently. The weight on her mind disappeared because she did not earn herself a living through work. She had one clear goal. Winning her boss's heart and marrying him. For the following week, Ellen did not encounter Jared and received a call from the demolition contractors, saying. They would visit in the afternoon someday to take some measurements of the place. It seemed like the procedure. Went smoothly as it was approved. Everyone in Lockwood Village was elated about the news. Thanks to its strategic geographic location, many could. Rake in a fortune. Those who earnestly hoped for demolition finally had their wish granted. Needless to say, Ellen bumped into Selena every day at work. The latter seemed haughty, their gazes met every time, but she did not approach Ellen. The month was about to end when the villagers received the demolition payment, but there was nothing in Ellen's bank account. Therefore, she dropped by the demolition company for inquiry. The contractor told her that the payment was cancelled because her name was not included in the family's registration. Since she had to register her name under the family before collecting the money, she needed to look into the problem. Chapter 1804 Olivia's Pretentious Kindness By the time Ellen arrived home, Lilac's family had stopped by. They heard of the demolition payment, so they paid a visit to claim their share. Ellie, part of the amount belongs to you and me. Isn't this how inheritance works? Her uncle, Garrett, cut to the chase. She was stunned momentarily as mixed feelings churned in her stomach. That's right. Ellie, you've been living with Jessica, but you're not her biological granddaughter. We're supposed to be her immediate family according to the law, Nicole chipped in. So, we should split it into six among my mother, the three of us, your uncle, and you. Ellen was at her wit's end. Grievance stifled her chest as Jessica once told her that the house would belong to her and no one else. Every nook and cranny of the place carried precious memories, it was her home. What's with the silence, Ellie? Perhaps, you don't want to share. Are you trying to hog everything? Garrett's wife was making assumptions. T that's not it. Ellen clasped her hands together and lowered her head. That's final, then. You should register your name. Once you have the money, you gotta transfer our portions to us. You know what to do. Garrett wrapped it up. Lilac's silence indicated her agreement with their decision because of her dire need for money to have a better life. Although she was aware that Jessica bestowed everything on Ellen, the amount of money was too much for her to ignore. Sharing it amongst the family wouldn't hurt, would it? Everyone left once the discussion was over, leaving Ellen sitting in a corner like a fragile animal that could not resist. Tears finally escaped from her eyes, and pain squeezed her heart as she observed the furniture at home. At that moment, her phone rang. She glanced at it and quelled the waves of emotions. Who is this? Ellie, it's me. I heard that Aunt Jessica's house is going to be demolished. Any updates yet? Olivia inquired. 
Aunt Olivia, I haven't received the money yet. The contractor asked me to make an appeal to register my name to. Grandma's. Did Garrett and the others drop by? Yeah, they left not long ago. I knew it. How could they? Ellie, don't resent them. This is how the world works. Olivia pretended to be the nice. Aunt, I I don't resent anyone. So, are you going to listen to them? Olivia tested the water. What else could Ellen do? Could she even say, no? Unless an impartial head of the family made the call, she had no other options. Besides, she was not Jessica's biological granddaughter. It was only foster care at most, bringing it to the court would be a futile struggle. Don't worry, Ellie. Appeal and receive the payment first. We'll see what we can do then. I'll have Uncle Connor put in some good words for you, said Olivia. Thank you, Aunt Olivia. Ellen could not be any more grateful. Once the call terminated, a pang of relief hit Olivia. It's easy as I expected. Since she has no one to rely on, she'll be creamed off for sure. Ellen applied for an appeal the next day, but she was stuck in the procedure. In truth, Jessica's absence rendered it difficult as it required a lot of documents. When Monday came, she had no choice but to put it on hold to go to work. Astoria would be leaving the company in a few days, so it was impossible to apply for leave during the handover. The workplace gave Ellen warmth, for Astoria treated her well and even asked other colleagues to look after Ellen. In her stead, Chapter 1805 Luxurious Restaurant. Everyone got off work on time, but Ellen decided to stay. She loved working overtime alone in the spacious area. Sitting at the receptionist's desk, she took her time organizing the documents and identifying every problem that occurred. Time flew past without her realizing and it struck 7 p.m. A silhouette exited the elevator, revealing a sculpture-like face. A sheen of light on him added lusters of grace to his every movement. As he strode over from the elevator, he noticed the girl sitting behind the receptionist's desk and frowned. Is she working overtime again for free? Receptionists had redundant jobs, hence the fixed salary. Hearing the rhythmic click, Ellen raised her head and met eyes with the incoming man. Her slightly weary eyes lit up instantly. Working overtime, she smiled. Yeah, it's quite late. You should get going too. The way he spoke sounded as if the boss was speaking, but she shrugged it off because of his young face. He must be worried. About that, can I buy you a meal? She invited him for a meal on the spur of the moment. Jared, who intended to leave, halted and looked back at her for a few seconds. He checked the time through his wristwatch. My pleasure. Let's go. Her mind went blank at his cool acceptance. Holy moly. Just how bold am I to invite him for a meal? And to think that I hit a home run. Squealing on the inside, she hurriedly tidied up the desk and accidentally dropped a file onto the floor. After picking it up, she banged her head against the chair. Judging from the loud sound, it had to hurt a lot. Jared came up to her upon hearing the noise. No need to rush. Take your time. Done. Ellen took her bag and scurried out of the receptionist's desk, revealing the red tinge on her forehead. The sight of the red mark pricked his heart a little. Be careful next time. I will. It's just, I didn't expect a, yes, from you. She added, I know a decent restaurant nearby. Let's shoot off. I made a reservation. Let's go. Huh. I'm the one buying you a meal, though. A confused Ellen blinked her eyes. Why is he the one making a, reservation. It's on me tonight. You can have it your way next time. Jared never let women foot the bills. Ellen's cheek was burning in embarrassment. It was as if she invited him just to get herself a free meal. She entered the man's sports car, which coursed its way along the street. Sitting on the passenger seat, she felt the gazes land upon her. She sneaked a few peeks at the man beside her. A sophisticated aura seemed to be shrouding him under the streetlights as if they were of a different world. Where are we going? She became curious. You'll know when you're there. He frequented a particular restaurant for meals. It served high quality food but was not open to the public. The car was driven into a garden before stopping at a vast field. Ellen scrutinized the stunning area in surprise. Ignorant of such scenery at the city center. 
with the wispy fragrance from the rose garden an enchanting night. Sky, it was a rare sight to behold in the city. It must be expensive to have a meal here. To not put her under pressure, Jared answered, it's affiliated with the company, so every expense made can be reimbursed. She bought his words due to the great employee welfare at Presgrave Group. The moment she entered one of the lounges in the restaurant, she exclaimed once again, this is not a place I could step foot into in the past. While they were ordering food, she noticed that the prices were excluded from the menu. She heard of most of the ingredients, but never once had she tasted them because it was not something ordinary people could afford. Chapter 1806 Garrett's Threat Ellen ordered only one dish before handing over the menu to Jared, who ordered six dishes in one go. At that moment, her phone, which displayed Garrett's phone number, rang and tightened her chest. Excuse me, Mr. Tillman, I have an incoming call. She glanced at the room before taking a seat on the couch. Hi. Uncle Garrett. What are you doing, Ellen? Why haven't you registered your name? Are you doing this because you don't wanna share the money? Sorry, Uncle Garrett, but I have work. What's so important about work? This is of utmost urgency. I need the money, so stop dilly-dallying. Tears of grievance pooled in her eyes, prompting her to lower her head. It's not on purpose, Uncle Garrett. I'm just busy with work. I don't care. You'd better give me the money by Friday while I'm still nice, he threatened. Ellen was a nonentity to Garrett's family. Besides, she alone could do nothing even if they treated her like a rat. It was safe to say that money had awakened the evil in them. I'm sorry, Uncle Garrett. You only have a few days. If you don't settle the issue by then, I'll cause a stir at your workplace. Let's see if you're allowed to work still when the time comes. He hurt her with mean words before terminating the call. Ellen's body trembled as despair surged in her. If Jessica were here, she would not have allowed such a thing to happen. Knowing that the call had ended, Jared swept a glance at her only to see tears trickling down and wetting her gray dress. He sprang up and crouched in front of her. Did something happen? She blamed herself for showing her forlorn side to him, so she quickly wiped her tears off. Nothing. Something flew. Into my eyes. That's why. Yet, the unbidden tears streamed nonstop. Those gorgeous, teary eyes could easily make one feel bad. The weird sensation flooded Jared again as he watched her crying, stifling his chest so hard that he could barely breathe. You can talk to me about anything. His voice sounded airy. Ellen bit her rosy lip. Wouldn't that be annoying? Not at all. Just feel free to talk to me. He seated himself next to her as he was all ears. She took a deep breath while thinking, where should I start first? I think he should know the entirety of the situation, or he won't be able to follow. My parents passed away when I was young, so my uncle fostered my elder brother and me, but my brother left. Because of a serious illness. I didn't even get to see him in his last moments. Ellen felt hot behind her eyes, and he drew a few pieces of tissue for her since it was close to him. She wiped her tears while continuing, then, my uncle sent me to my aunt's place. Jessica treated me like I was her granddaughter. We only had each other, but life was great. To me, she was my grandmother. At that point, another stream of tears ran down her cheeks, and she choked on her voice. But she left me too. I'm all alone again. Jared sympathized with her past. So, is someone giving you a hard time now? It's all because of my grandmother's demolished house. She did not apply for adoption, so she's not my official guardian. Instead, my uncle is the one on the papers. Chapter 1807 Connor's Help Now, my relatives want their share of the demolition payment. I'm still new to the company, and there's a lot for me to catch up with, so I couldn't go to the authority to transfer my name yet. My uncle called because he's angry. That I went to work instead of solving the issue first. If I drag things out any longer, he said he's going to make a scene at work so that I'll lose my job. Quote, now that Ellen recounted the whole story, she felt utterly helpless. She had no intention to be all crybaby in front of such a handsome guy, but she could not help it. It hurt too much. How could they? They've seriously gone overboard.
Even Jared was exasperated as an outsider. It's not like I'm doing it on purpose, but I can't apply for leave when there's a handover going on. Astoria is going to leave the company to get married soon. If I don't receive training for my jurisdiction these days, I won't be able to continue my work, she explained. The payment is meant for only you. They don't have the right to take it from you. You don't have to split the money, he reasoned. But I am not grandma's family on paper. I won't be able to get the money either. Ellen was at her wit's end. You can if you apply for an adoption certificate. No one can take the money away from you. But my grandmother is not around anymore. Is it still possible? Why not? You've been living under the same roof for 16 years, and she acknowledged your relationship. Even if the law is dead, you can find something to prove it. It's not as easy as it sounds. I'm stuck at the procedure. Ellen had no alternatives to solve the problem. I can help. Jared could not resist the urge to intervene in the issue, although he did not know why he could not. Bear the sight of her dwelling on sadness, it pained him to see her cry. Huh, you can. As it was a situation where she needed help desperately, it warmed her heart to have someone. Offering help. Yes. I have a bunch of great lawyers who can help. Really. That's great. I can't be any more grateful to you. She expressed her gratitude vehemently to her savior. The waiters began to serve the dishes just at the right time. Jared urged her to fill her stomach first and promised to seek help from a lawyer. Ellen, you should keep the money for yourself. Don't share it with others. They don't see you as their family, so you shouldn't mind them. But, as long as you become your grandmother's legal adoptive daughter, it's rightfully yours. No one can take them. Still, Garrett and the other's forceful attitude seeped into her mind. Got it. Just tell me if you need anything. No, you've gone out of your way to help me come this far. I shouldn't trouble you anymore. Ellen was grateful. Could you pass me your phone for a moment? She gave him her phone obediently, and the man frowned at the seriously damaged phone screen. Quietly, he dialed his number with her gadget. This is my number. Ring me up if there's trouble. Sweetness and warmth sprang in her chest. She felt honored to have his contact number. Following that, Jared even drove her home and eased her up by saying there was nothing to worry about regarding the demolition payment. His friend would be able to help her. Despite the gratitude, Ellen felt sorry to have him take it upon himself. She made up her mind to do everything she could to repay his kindness in the future. If she did not have the chance to do so, she would remember everything he had done for her wholeheartedly. At 9 p.m., she received a call from Connor. He heard of Garrett's demand and assured her that he would meet Garrett to talk over it. Chapter 1808 The Lawyer's Help Ellen was aware that it would end up like water off a duck's back to Garrett and the others anyway. They had proven their stance toward the situation and set their heart to get the money. Now, she would be able to receive the money as long as she could receive an adoptive certificate to prove herself as Jessica's granddaughter. On the other hand, Connor was so livid that he lost his appetite for dinner. How could they possibly do that? Who says that we must share the money with them? A guilty Olivia was standing behind him, probably because they're jealous that Ellen will have the money all for herself. What right do they have to demand the money? Aunt Jessica treated Ellen like her biological granddaughter, so she's the only one with the rightful inheritance for that house. That's true, but Aunt Lilac is on the bread line. They won't let such a chance slip through their fingers. Besides, Aunt Jessica didn't legally adopt Ellen before she passed away. She dared not reveal that she was the one who led Lilac behind the curtains. After Connor attempted to pull some strings, he realized it was not something easy to be settled. Why don't we give up on our share? I bet no one can stop Aunt Lilac. Olivia was happy as long as Ellen would not get the money all for herself. Bitterness crept into Connor as it would stave off his guilt if Ellen had that money to sustain her life. Early in the morning, Ellen woke up to receive a notice from the Human Resource Department. She was granted a three-day leave, but she thought it was strange because she did not apply for it. While questions sprouted in her mind, she had another incoming call from the lawyer Jared introduced her to. 
Miss Reese, are you available today? We can apply for the adoption certificate. Yes, I am, she quickly replied. Okay, I'll be on my way to pick you up. She had packed up the necessary documents, hoping that they would be of help. Later, a black SUV parked in front of her, and a middle-aged man escorted her into the car. The sheer look of his neat suit was enough to tell that he was someone elite. His name was Burton Yarrow, and she addressed him as Mr. Yarrow. She narrated the whole story while they were on their way. Don't worry, Miss Reese. It's not that difficult. But I asked the authority, and they said it won't be easy. It's okay. Just leave it to me. Burton's voice was as gentle as the spring breeze to Ellen. She figured that it was all. Thanks to Jared, whose friend was equally capable as he was. Unbeknownst to her, Burton did not accept her case because of a friend's request. It was an order from his boss, so. How could he possibly not do as he was told? Not only was a failure not accepted, but he also had to treat her. Gently. He could not understand how Jared came to know a poor girl. Although Ellen was a looker, they would not have had. Reasons to know each other. Yet, his only duty was to win the case, he had no right to butt in their business. Please come with me, Miss Reese. I will need your signature or fingerprint later. With the prepared materials, Ellen followed him into an office, while Burton brought along some materials obtained. From other means, compared to her documents, they were more legally susceptible. The authorized person asked his assistant to fill out a document right after he perused them. She filled up the document and inked her fingerprint on it accordingly. So, is this it? As expected, she soon received a newly printed adoption certificate. Keep it. If you lose it by chance, you can reapply for another one. Now, I'll accompany you to the demolition. Contractor to proceed with the demolition payment. Chapter 1509 Garrett's Greed Thank you so much, Mr. Yarrow. I can't be any more grateful to you. You don't have to. Instead, Mr. Presgrave. Ellen was surprised when Burton mentioned that very person. Aren't you Mr. Tillman's friend? Burton soon comprehended the situation and quickly corrected it. Yes, yes. Mr. Tillman is the one you should. Thank. He asked for my help, but it was just a trivial matter to me. It's nothing big. She nodded. I will thank him. She received the demolition payment, which was worth about a million dollars. Her mind went blank the moment. She comprehended the amount. Was it always this much? Congratulations, Miss Reese. You'll be able to live a better life with this money. Thanks. I didn't expect myself to have the privilege to enjoy such a fortune either. Never in her wildest dream had. She expected herself to be this lucky. Nonetheless, her heart still ached at the fact that Jessica passed away before. The house was demolished. Otherwise, Ellen could have taken the chance to take her on a trip elsewhere. Burden left after driving her home. She sat in the living room and stared at her online bank statement, which baffled her into speechlessness. At that moment, her phone rang because of a call from Garrett, whom she did not have the nerve to leave. Hanging. Hey, Uncle Garrett. Got the money yet? It was an authoritative tone. Yeah, she did not lie to him. What? For real? How much is it? He was all excited about the idea to split the money. I have an adoption certificate, so I have the right to inherit the fortune. Sorry, Uncle Garrett. She mustered a lot of courage to level with him. What? Are you not going to share it? Ellen Reese, you greedy brat. You can't spend all of it on your own. I don't care. You must split it among us. The adoption certificate did not mean a thing to the persistent Garrett. Uncle Garrett, I'm the rightful heiress by the law. So, the money belongs to me. She attempted to reason with him. However, it enraged him. And who exactly are you, Ellen Reese? Don't blame us for doing this to you. If you don't do as we say, you'll never get away from us. Tears of grievance wet her eyes, but she fought them back. I'm truly sorry, Uncle Garrett. Subsequently, she ended the call. He spammed her with multiple calls thereafter, but she did not wish to answer them. Other relatives dialed her number in ones and twos, so she simply switched off her phone. Knowing that they would fly to her place, Ellen decided to crash at someone's place for the night to avoid them. 
At the same time, Olivia received a call from Garrett. Hey, Gary. She's ridiculous, Olivia. Ellen Reese, that brat, got the money and doesn't have the intention to share. She even mentioned having an adoption certificate. How did she get that? I don't care how the hell she got it. I estimated the house price in that area and bet she has about a million. That. Brad is trying to hog everything. Iyer prevailed over his reasons. It was as if the money belonged to them. Even Olivia could not help the jealousy. Although it was not a large sum to her, she rendered it, too much, for Ellen. Hence the need to split it up. You should be nicer to her. I bet she'll split it among you guys, she encouraged. Garrett and his family did not intend to give in just like that. If they claimed their share, each of them would at least have a hundred thousand. Meanwhile, Olivia tried to give Ellen a call, only to realize that the girl had turned her phone off. That's weird. Where? Did she get herself an adoption certificate? Connor asked around, and they said it's difficult to apply for one. Chapter 1810 Causing a Scene at the Company By then, Ellen was already hiding out at a hotel. When she recalled Lilac and her family's attitude, anxiety and terror overcame her, for she never knew that her relationship with them would end up so ferocious. While lying in bed, she grabbed her phone and suddenly remembered she had to thank someone, so she found Jared's number and typed out her gratitude in text. Mr. Tillman, thank you for helping me with such a huge favor. It's thanks to you that I got back the compensation. Funds. Next time, I'll treat you to a good meal. After sending that text, she did not expect he would reply so quickly, you don't have to thank me. The money is supposed to be yours in the first place. Ellen wanted to tell him more about her current situation but went against it later because she did not want to bother him, so she bid him good night. The following day, she did not dare to turn on her phone because her phone would blow up once she did. That was because the Andino siblings were out looking for her. Moreover, they found out from Olivia where Ellen was working, the Presgrave Group's reception area. That was why the Andino siblings decided to wait for her. There, with Selena's help, she received news that Ellen had not been coming to work these two days because she was on leave and would return to work tomorrow. Therefore, the Andino siblings knew when she worked as well. When Selena heard from her mom that Ellen had received a million dollars of compensation funds, she, too, was jealous. All her current expenses did not even reach such a massive amount, yet Ellen had already become rich. Overnight, Selena also knew that Lilac's family was chasing after Ellen for her compensation funds, and her thoughts were the same as her moms, both wished that Ellen would divide and distribute the money among them. There will be an exciting show at the company tomorrow. I'll get mom to inform me, and I'll head to the lobby to watch the show. On the other hand, Ellen was ready to head back to work. At 8.30 a.m., she arrived at the company and changed into her uniform. Then, she sat in her seat and began organizing the documents. Ellen, someone came looking for you yesterday. He says he's your relative, said the colleague beside her, who leaned over. Shock took over Ellen's face. What did he look like? It was a man, but he doesn't have a good attitude. Did you offend some big shot? Hearing that, Ellen became nervous as she remembered that Selena knew where she worked, so Garrett and the others should be aware too. No, they're my relatives, Ellen answered honestly. What kind of relatives are they? I would have thought they came here to settle scores with you. At that moment, Ellen felt like she was sitting on pins and needles. Will they be coming again today? Around 9.30 a.m., Selena received a call from her mom, saying that the Andino siblings had left home. Her lips hooked into a smile as she thought, this time, Ellen will lose her job. That's not all, for she will also be humiliated. At 10 a.m., Ellen suddenly felt anxious. It was then that she saw the Andino siblings appear at the entrance to the lobby, and her face instantly paled. Though they were the ones who were being unreasonable, they seemed more assertive and terrifying. So, you do work here, Ellen, Garrett called out. He was already in his late forties, yet he did not look like an elder. Instead, he behaved more like a debt collector. Ellie, we don't mean to make things difficult for you. 
Just divide the money according to how we discussed it. Hmm. Nicole suggested gently. I won't share any of the money with you. Ellen decided not to give in at the last moment. No matter the reason, she did not need to share her money. It was not out of greed but to defend her rights. HMPH. Look at this brat. She's so greedy at a young age and wants to keep all the money to herself. Garrett's tone was filled with sarcasm while looking at his siblings. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more videos.